your microphones while others are speaking. Second, uh, staff and system administration campuses, turn off your video camera unless you would like to speak. And if you would like to speak, uh, turn on your camera and then signal us by raising your hand. Finally, identify yourself when making comments or asking questions. Jess, could you call the roll, please? Regent President Many Deeds. Here. Regent Vice President Walsh. Here. Regent Atwell. Here. Regent Bechtel. Here. Regent Bogus. Here. Regent Colon. Here. Regent Greeby. Regent Jones. Here. Here. Regent Klein. Regent Lovesow. Here. Regent Miller. Here. Regent Drew Peterson. Here. Regent Chris Peterson. Here. Regent Rye. Here. Regent Saffold. Here. Here. Regent Tucker. Here. Here. Regent Underly. Here. Regent Weatherly. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start today's meeting with an introduction. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Jill Underly, who earlier this month began her term as State Superintendent of Public Instruction, succeeding Regent Emeritus Carolyn Sapper Taylor. Dr. Underly has a deep background in public education. Since 1999, she has worked as a high school and middle school and so social studies teacher, as an academic advisor in the UW College of Letters and Science, as a Title I consultant and assistant manager at the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Most recently, Dr. Underly served for six years as a <laughs> superintendent of the Pecatonica School District in Southwest Wisconsin. Dr. Underley received her bachelor's degree in history and sociology from Indiana University in Bloomington, a master's degree in secondary education from Indiana University, Purdue University, and a master's degree in educational administration and a doctorate in educational leadership and policy analysis from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Underley lives on a small farm in Southwest Wisconsin with her husband, John, and their two children. Uh, Regent Underley, we're delighted to welcome you to this board and would ask you to say a few words if you'd like. Thank you, thank you, President. Um, I'm really happy to be here, so thank you um, for welcoming me. I'm looking forward to my service here on the Board of Regents, so thank you. Well, thank you, Regent Underly. I, I know I speak for all members of the board and uh, saying that we look forward to working with you on all the issues that face us, so welcome. Uh, at this time, we have to, before we start our business, find out if there are any conflicts of interest. So are there board members who wish to declare any conflict of interest regarding today's open session agenda? Okay. Regent Underly? Yes. So you're uh, recusing yourself from the DPI item, item CPD. Uh, anyone else? Dr. Rye? Uh, I'll be recusing myself from item D from Capital Planning and Budget Committee. Regent Grebe. Okay, we'll make sure that we do that when we get to that point in the agenda. So at this time, and we're going to talk about the uh, UW system presidential search process. Um, one of the Board of Regents most significant responsibilities is to oversee the selection of president of the University of Wisconsin system. It's a responsibility we honor and take very seriously. Uh, following the resignation of President Ray Cross in 2020, we have been fortunate to have interim President Tommy Thompson at the helm uh, to guide the system through one of the most challenging periods in the history of this university, the state, the country, and the world. Uh, we uh, can't say enough about how his leadership has helped us get students back into the classroom or get their classes virtually, keep everyone safe, get the entire state vaccinated by opening up the university campuses uh, to have them be available to give shots to people who needed them or wanted them uh, to lead us through the budget process that we just went through, who came up with ideas about scholarships for people who deserved them and needed them in order to graduate, to include all underrepresented groups in the system to make that his goal. Uh, we appreciate and applaud all of those efforts that he's made, and I really want to thank you again for that. So now we have to look to the future beyond at 
least my time probably here. Uh, Region Vice President Karen Walsh has been charged to lead a search committee to identify the next president of this great system. Uh, I would ask her now to provide us with an update. Thank you, Regent President Many Deeds, and thank you also for uh, your confidence in me to chair this committee. Um, just about a year ago was a fairly dark time in the hallways of UW system. Uh, a search that ended in a way no one wanted it to. Uh, during a pandemic, uh, there was probably a heat wave and floods somewhere as well, but it, it certainly was not a happy time. We threw a Hail Mary pass, and luckily it was caught by the gentleman three seats to my right. And his leadership has pulled us into a position where the next search for the president is going to be made that much easier because we moved forward. Uh, I think, and I, I've said this all along, the next president of this system has been watching us. Um, perhaps from afar, since we did make the news more than once, um, and perhaps from close by. In any case, the strides that we've made since the search bottomed up uh, has been absolutely incredible. I'm so proud of all the faculty, staff, and students uh, for their efforts, and also the system staff who supported everything we did. You really did yeoman's work. And the best way we can honor that work is to come together and choose a president that will lead us with vision into the future. Um, you will see when you get a chance to look at the search committee, there are 18 members besides myself. Um, we wanted to have as many voices at the table as we could from different walks of work uh, at the university system. So you will see not only regents, but faculty, provosts, chancellors, staff, and a student or two. Um, all of those folks share uh, what Regent Many Deeds and I feel um, is a passion for higher education that simply is going to drive this search forward. Um, and as I look around the table here at my Regent colleagues and the folks who will be making the final choice, um, we commit to you right now that we are going to bring you some fabulous candidates. We're going to work very hard. Uh, and um, hopefully that decision will be made easier by that work done on, on our behalf. So thank you in advance to all the folks who will support us, to all of those who are going to serve. We have a big job to do, and I'm so appreciative that you will be at the table with us. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Walsh. Now we start with the reports from our various committees. First would be the report from the Capital Planning and Budget Committee. I call upon Dr. Ride to give Regent Ride to give the uh, report of the Capital Planning and Budget Committee. Thank you, Regent President. Many deeds. The Capital Planning and Budget Committee met yesterday, and due to the power outage, uh, unfortunately, Senior Associate Vice President Alex Rowe's report and slideshow was postponed to our next meeting. Chancellor Blank, Vice Chancellor Rob Kramer, and Executive Director Aaron Oliver made a presentation about the proposed memorandum of agreement with the University Research Park on behalf of UW Madison. The memorandum outlines the collaborative process between the research park and the university to identify parcels for development both on and off campus. The agreement addresses pricing mechanisms and investments of proceeds on behalf of the university at the foundation. The committee also considered seven resolutions. On behalf of UW Eau Claire, the committee considered and approved item D to lease student athletic events and recreation space within the Sonatag event and recreation complex and approval of a new $90 per semester student approved segregated fee that will be applied towards the lease of the facility. Chancellor Jim Schmidt gave an overview of the project, which is a result of a very unique community partnership between the Mayo Clinic Health System Northwest, Blue Gold Real Estate, and the City of Eau Claire to provide additional athletics and recreational needs for UW Eau Claire and the collaborative use of space with Mayo Clinic, who contributes sports medicine, athletics, and human performance training expertise, rehabilitation, medical imaging, and research conducted with UW uh, Eau Claire Department of Kinesiology and other academic departments. The committee also reviewed and approved item E on behalf of UW Green Bay, a request to exchange a board owned parcel of land on the south side of the campus for one owned by University Village Housing Incorporated on the east side of the campus. After the exchange, of High will construct a 200-bed residence hall 
for second year students on their south side parcel, which is located closer to the center of campus. Although the parcels are of different sizes, it was determined that there would be no cost to either party. Next, the committee considered the approval on behalf of UW, UW Madison item G, authority to construct the Cole Center addition and renovation project to provide additional space for strength and conditioning, sports medicine, academics, and administrative functions. Renovation work includes upgrades to practice and playing surfaces and service level spaces impacting locker rooms, media rooms, club rooms, and kitchen and dining areas. On behalf of UW Oshkosh, the committee approved item H, granting authority to construct a minor facilities renewal project to replace the plumbing riser in the south tower of the Grugen Conference Center, Grugenhagen Conference Center, sorry, Jim, and renovate restrooms to meet current ADA accessibility requirements. The committee approved item I to construct three all agency maintenance and repair projects. At UW Stevens Point, the project will replace, will, will replace the roofs on the Allen Center and Watson Hall. Two other projects at UW Milwaukee will A, replace the central heating plant controls, and B, upgrade exterior light fixtures that illuminate buildings and pedestrian walkways. On the behalf of UW Lacrosse, the committee approved item J to construct a 2019 21 classroom renovation instructional technology improvement program project to renovate space in Mitchell Hall to expand and enhance three heavily used instructional laboratories serving UW Lacrosse's nationally accredited athletic training programs. These larger spaces will pro provide the flexibility to support a more diverse array of instructional methods and activities. And lastly, the committee considered an improved item K on behalf of UW Madison to increase the amount of outstanding debt payment by $106,677.41 to facilitate the transfer of 1.91 acres of land and improvements from the Department of Public Construction to the Board of Regents that was approved by the board in April. The State Budget Office recently reviewed its original analysis and determined it had overlooked past projects at the building, which increased the amount of outstanding debt due. Mr. President, first I would like to move item D, authority to enter into a lease with the Eau Claire Community Complex Incorporated, also known as the Sonateg Project. Do we have a second? Second. Is there a discussion regarding this item? Not? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Next, I'd like to move items E, G, H, I, and J. Any second? Second. All those in favor? Okay. Aye. 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 Okay. And then finally, I'd like to move item K, authority to transfer land and improvements on behalf of UW Madison. Second, please. Second. Okay, I guess I forgot to ask for a discussion last time, so I'll do that. Any discussion on this item? Seeing no one wanting to discuss the item, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Regent President, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. I will now call upon Regent Atwal to present a report from the Research Economic Development and Innovation Committee, which is one of the most exciting committees in the system. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Regent President. Many deeds. Uh, the power outage, like the other committees, gave rise uh, in our committee to some unscripted yet uh, fertile chaos. Uh, a condition that I am not entirely lacking appreciation for. And uh, as a result of this, we had a panel that was scheduled regarding WISIS's impact uh, on the 11 regional comprehensives. And uh, we had scheduled faculty uh, and student representatives as separate panels, uh, and we were unable to do that due to technological conditions. Uh, but we wanna thank them and apologize uh, uh, well, I don't know, we didn't cause the loss of power, but we're sorry that it happened and we look forward to actually uh, conducting those uh, at a future meeting of Reading. However, uh, we were able as a result of that to go uh, deeper into the chancellor portion of the panel. And we were fortunate to be uh, joined by WISIS head Arjun Sanja and uh, Debbie Ford, Chancellor Debbie Ford, and uh, Andy, Andy Levitt, uh, Jim Schmidt, and Catherine Frank, uh, who each talked about the impact of, of WISIS in the areas of uh, undergraduate research in particular, 
uh, technology transfer and the commercialization initiatives that occur across the 11 comprehensive campuses. Uh, it was a spirited and informative discussion. And um, I think of note in particular was that WISE has continued at a high level of activity uh, throughout the COVID conditions across those campuses. Uh, we didn't lose uh, any volume of initiatives. And uh, so kudos to the campuses and, and the students and the faculty and WISE itself for, for reacting effectively. Um, we, uh, in addition to, in addition to um, the normal sort of technology transfer student undergraduate research, uh, there were several discussions that involved stories of faculty recruitment, the impact of WISIS on faculty recruitment due to the uh, unique uh, or almost unique nationally um, availability of WISIS to assist in this process. So. Uh, Chancellor Levitt actually told a, a story from his time in West Georgia where he was attempting to get some help with intellectual property on a couple of things that he had invented, and uh, there was just nothing available in the Georgia system to assist the faculty or the students or anyone else uh, kind of work through the process of intellectual property. And, uh, and we have that here, and we're very fortunate. It also spills over into the critical role of our regional comprehensives in as being hubs of economic development and community life uh, in in the regions that that they serve. So, um, in closing, we wanted to note that WISIS has been recognized uh, as a global good practice by the University Industry Innovation Network based in Amsterdam. Uh, just this past month, Chancellor Ford, WISIS President Arjun Sanja, and U.S. System President Tommy Thompson addressed UIIN's international audience of university practitioners to highlight the Weiss's story. So I think uh, you'll all agree as we did as a panel, this is a highly effective illustration of the strength of the ROI that Weiss's delivers to our campuses and to the people of Wisconsin. It's a fitting example of the new Wisconsin idea in action. In fact, our ready vice chair, Chris Peterson, did suggest that we devote more resources to telling the Weiss's story across the state because uh, because it's kind of a, a not well enough known jewel. So I want to thank everyone for reacting and this concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Atwell. It's nice to see that in spite of the glitch with the technology, we were able to go ahead and facilitate a spirited discussion. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to do more of those in the future if we ever have that problem again, right? We, we enjoy spirited discussions. I know you do. Thank you for your report. Next. Uh, I call upon Regent Weatherly to present a report from the Audit Committee. Uh, thank you, Regent President. Uh, the Audit Committee met yesterday morning, like the previous two, without the benefit of uh, power. Uh, Chief Audit Executive Lori Stoltz re uh, reviewed the progress to date on the fiscal year 2022 audit plan. There were a few audits carried forward from last year, but those are concluding. She confirmed that her office is making solid progress on the plan and expects to bring more reports to the committee in October. Ms. Stortz then provided a high level summary of the results of the audits recently issued by the Office of Internal Audit since we last met in June. This includes an executive summary of the change requests of bank and contact information audit and the purchasing card cards continuous audit results summary. Overall, she is pleased with the responses from management. Chief Compliance Officer Katie Ignatowski presented the fiscal year 2022 compliance plan for our approval, and it was passed unanimously. The regents expressed strong support for the compliance function and stressed the importance of each UW institution, excuse me, expressed the importance that each UW institution make compliance a high, a high priority and dedicate appropriate resources. Ms. Ignatowski then requested the committee approve revisions made to the Chief Compliance Officer reporting line, and Ms. Stortz joined her in presenting an update to the University of Wisconsin System Board of Regents Audit Committee Charter, which we supported. The discussion included our revamping of the UW System Hotline. Periodic updates regarding the hotline relaunch will be provided to the committee by Ms. Ignatowski and Ms. Stortz. Additionally, they will present the three lines of defense model when we meet in October. The model is a best practice for the design of internal controls and how the board, management, internal audit, compliance, and risk management can operate most effectively and efficiently. I move to approve resolution E1, the fiscal year 2022 annual compliance plan for the UW system. Resolution F1, 
the Chief Compliance Officer reporting line, and finally, Resolution F2, approving the update to the University of Wisconsin System Board of Regents Audit Committee Charter. Thank you. Second, that motion. Thank you for the second. Any discussion regarding any of these items? If not, all those in favor, say aye. 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 The motion carries. That concludes my report. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we're re returning to the Region Beck Bechtel report on Business and Finance Committee. Region Bechtel, please. Thank you, Region President Many Deeds. Uh, we had a pretty full agenda. There's going to be 13 matters that we dealt with and we'll be seeking your approval today on. Uh, we convened yesterday morning to consider our July agenda items. There are no conflicts of interest noted. Uh, our first, after we approved the minutes, we first went to a discussion and approved a request to amend Regent Policy Document 25-4, Strategic Planning and, and High or Large Risk Projects. UWSA Associate Vice President for the Office of Learning and Information Technology Services, Stephen Hopper, presented an overview of that revision that formally requires the Board of Regents to approve all IT projects over $1 million before they can begin and delegates and delegates approval of IT projects under 1 million to the president and chancellors with differing thresholds and reporting requirements based on the size of the institution. Additionally, the policy incorporates procedural provisions related to the master lease, a program offered by the Department of Administration used by state agencies and the university to finance uh, large IT purchases over several years. And as all the regions know, we've got a number of very significant IT projects on the books and that we're uh, proceeding through. Uh, so this is an important policy revision. Next, the committee approved a project submitted by UW Madison's interim uh, vice chancellor for finance and administration, our friend Rob Kramer, to replace the electronic door access system uh, here on the UW Madison campus. The current system will reach its end of life in December of 2021. This has an estimated cost of $6 million. This project is critical to maintain the security and remain in compliance with security guidelines for federally uh, funded research projects. Uh, obviously an important initiative for our friends here at UW-Madison. Next, we move to a contract involving Workday. Brent Tilton, the UW System Director of Procurement, led a panel of UWSA and UW-Madison staff in introducing a service agreement with Workday. This is a $59 million 10-year contract and it's for contemporary cloud-based enterprise resource planning software. This software serves as a key piece of the ATP, that's the Administrative Transformation Program, providing co coherency of the administrative in infrastructure. This will improve effectiveness, efficiency, and functionality, again, across the UW system. Next, Mr. Hopper returned to provide a snapshot of the UW system's semi-annual status report on large vital information technology projects. Covering 14 projects which are pending, he focused on several key accomplishments and some projects for us to watch. The procurement to pay automation project uh, successfully completed phase one in April 2021 and was an overall success. In the first seven weeks after go live, over 23,500 purchase orders flowed through this system, totaling $46.7 million with 87% of the transactions being approved in zero to one days. So a very good start for this project. The team now shifts to focus on phase two, which will add more procurement efficiencies. UW-Madison restarted its endpoint management project, which was on pause due to COVID-19 and is a key strategic project to improve its information security posture. That's expected to be completed later this fall. The vast majority of the portfolio is either on track or experiencing minor delays for which management is aware and seeking resolution, and we had discussion around those items. However, Mr. Hopper did highlight the status of the Administrative Transformation Project, ATP. Since February 2021, Board of Regents meeting, the ATP pre-planning project was extended by one month. That allowed them to complete the workday contract negotiation, and it went uh, $247,000 over budget and reduced its scope due to a failed RFT to select a systems integrator. Now, once the workday contract is signed, which we, we will be approving today, the pre-planning project will be formally closed. Furthermore, the total budget for the full ATP implementation project has 
been reduced by $247,000 to account for that pre-planning overrun. And the new system integrator RFP is now underway and will be completed as part of the full ATP project. Now, clearing these hurdles is critical for the overall success of the project and senior UW system leadership are actively working towards stabilizing the health of the project. This is another example illustrating how this oversight that we've put in place for these large and high risk projects helps identify and correct obstacles while they are manageable. UWSA staff led by Mr. Tilton joined the committee to go over a bookstore and dining contracts for several campuses. And there's quite a few of these. The bookstore contract between UW Eau Claire and Follett Higher Education Group will begin this month for a term of one year with an option of five renewable one year extensions. In addition to an estimated commission of $1.41 million to UW Eau Claire, Follett will provide $30,000 for improvements to the bookstore and equipment for the textbook rental program. Going on to dining service contracts, we have three of these. UW La Crosse uh, is entering into, would, would enter into a contract with Compass Group, under which Compass Group will operate all dining services, retail operations, catering, conferences, camps, and summer activities. UW La Crosse is guaranteed an annual minimum of $200,000 or commission from sales, whichever is greater. The second dining services contract uh, that we reviewed is between UW River Falls and Compass Group again, similar to the UW La Crosse contract. It's an extension of two additional one year extensions with the campus receiving, in this case, approximately $278,000 annually in commission from sales. The final approved dining services contract by our committee is between UW Superior and Compass Group. This includes the same services and two additional one year extensions as the previous contracts. UW Superior is guaranteed a minimum of $38,500 or commission from sales again, whichever is greater. Then we looked at three contracts for approval on behalf of UW Madison and its very important research functions. Up first was the contract between the university and the National Football League. The NFL will provide three just about $4 million, I won't give you the exact figure there, in support of a four-year multi-site investigation involving the development and validation of new technologies toward muscle injury risk mitigation in collegiate football players, and focusing in particular on hamstring uh, strains and tears and, and whatnot. UW-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health will coordinate this collaborative research effort uh, with the NFL. Next, we heard about a proposed standard research agreement between UW-Madison and Galilea Biosciences. And I do wanna note for the record that Regent Abwell abstained from this and will be abstaining on the vote uh, before the full board. The company is sponsoring a two-year research project involving molecular compounds that are important for cancer research and other forms of research. UW-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health and the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery in collaboration with researchers from Wharf Therapeutics uh, all will be involved in that important project. The last UW-Madison contract was a master clinical agreement that we reviewed with Novartis Pharmaceuticals. This agreement replaces a previous agreement recently expired. This continues a successful partnership that has produced over $10 million for UW-Madison thus far. Two more items. The committee approved the request to amend Regent Policy RPD 17-4, Equal Opportunity uh, employment opportunities. Uh, presented by the UWSA Chief Human Resources Officer Dan Chan, Channon and its Senior Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Officer Warren Anderson. Now these suggested updates will bring the policy into compliance with federal law, state law and executive orders. In addition, we approved a request to rescind related policies which are now obsolete. Lastly, Chuck Saunders, UWSA Executive Director and Operations Manager of the Office of Trust Funds, and Rose Stevenson, the TSA 403B Plan Administrator, gave an overview of the program's history and upcoming enhancements to the supplemental, this is a voluntary program, the supplemental retirement savings program offered to UW system employees. We were cut short on time. We may bring them back and have a, a, a additional discussion on this item, but it was a very good report and on an important program that uh, provides for retirement benefits uh, for our employees. So in conclusion, 
And on behalf of the business and finance committee, and with, I would note that Regent Adwell would be abstaining on item M, but I'll move them all. I would now move for approval of agenda item C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, and O. <laughs> Thank you. It was a busy day. It was a busy day. Can I have a second, please? Second. Is there any discussion regarding any of these items? You heard of course. Thank you, uh, President Menendez, and uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Bechtel, uh, for your report. I wanted to uh, inform the board, uh, because Workday is part of this, uh, I wanted to uh, just mention once again <clears throat> how important it is. Um, there's two things that I wanted to bring up to the full board. Uh, Workday is a contract uh, that's going to be with us. It's, it's about almost $60 million. And it's just part of the total package that's going to that's going to be taken up by this board and the university system uh, to transform all administrative practices for all the universities and to put all of our data into the cloud. This, along with IT as a service, uh, which is is going to be following along and with ATP. It's going to be the biggest transformation of the operation of the university possibly ever. And it's truly going to make it a unified system and it's going to protect us. And in regards to protecting us, Warren Gade re retired as chief of technology services this past week. And having the opportunity with his retirement I have consolidated the technology and the IT and the IT security into a new division uh, headed by Stephen Hopper. And I've upgraded Kathy Meyer uh, for IT security. All of you, we've had discussions the last two board meetings on IT security. And I keep telling you that this is the biggest concern for the university. and. Uh, by being hacked and having our data revealed. And uh, especially at Madison with uh, all the research, Madison and Milwaukee uh, data that could be compromised. And so by doing this, uh, since I asked for uh, personnel from uh, the legislature and they didn't give it to us on IT security, I have, thanks to uh, Chancellor Joe Gow, we've been able to transfer some positions from the cross and we're putting it into IT security. So beefing up IT security, combining that with the technology services, putting it into a whole new division on IT. And it's uh, gonna be much more efficient, but much more secure. And I just wanted to let the board know that these things are going on. And I want the board to be very much involved in this ATP process because it's the biggest uh, uh, it's the biggest thing going forward on the university and uh, Chancellor Blank has been a leader in this and I thank her for that. And uh, Chancellor Blank and I have reached a memorandum of understanding how we're gonna proceed. And we're going in front of the Department of Administration uh, this coming week on it. And I just wanted to give you uh, the background information and the fact that we're reformulating technology into security and making it one division. That's gonna be much better and hopefully will help us protect uh, our data and our assets. Thank you, so, President. Thank you, President Thompson. Any other discussion? Try to remember to look at our regents appearing by WebEx. Okay. So, do we have a all those in favor of voting yes, please? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Passes. Thank you. For that Present. report. I now would like to call upon Regent Bogos to present the report from the Education Committee. Oh, President Manatees. Did I miss you? I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. If I may, um, was the item that Bob at Regent Atwell uh, abstained in, was that going to be up for comment and discussion? Well, we certainly can do that. I think it was my understanding was that uh, Regent Alwell was just abstaining 
and uh, that there wasn't going to be anything else further. But if you would like to have a discussion about that, we can step back and uh, have a discussion about that. So please go ahead. Thank you so much. I just have a, a comment and and just a couple of questions uh, relating to this issue uh, because I may abstain as well. I just want to start off by saying that I'm in support of stem cell research and the hopes they bring uh, to cure uh, diseases that affect many. Uh, but I'm against uh, research that destroys or exploits uh, human embryos uh, from abortion. I'm against uh, this, the destruction of life at any stage of life from conception uh, to uh, death. I believe in the infinite worth and the dignity of those unborn babies, that dignity and worth that they share with us. At one point, all of us were embryos ourselves. I understand that there are morally acceptable forms of embryonic stem cell research. I personally want to learn more about that. Um, I'm going to focus my next couple of months and reaching out to my uh, faith advisors to help me on my journey of learning. I also want to uh, dedicate some time to meet uh, with faculty and staff here at UWM to understand uh, this issue better so that I can be better informed in the future on how I move forward with a decision as it relates uh, to these uh, matters. I have two questions that might help me uh, to see if I can support this or if I also will abstain. Uh, the questions are, are, are two. The first question is, uh, do you know uh, if the embryo was from a miscarriage uh, or from an abortion? That's the first question. You, you want me to go ahead and answer that first? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Regent Cologne, respect your position and where you're coming from and appreciate the question and inquiry. Um, and certainly Regent Atwell can speak for himself, but there was some question that there, uh, there is a human embryonic uh, uh, cell uh, that may be used in this process uh, from the Netherlands and the derivation, uh, whether it was from miscarriages or abortion was somewhat unknown. And I believe that's why Regent Atwell abstained as he did. If I've stated that correct, Bob. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other question is, uh, were the embryonic stem cells obtained without creating or harming an embryo? I would not be able to answer that question. Okay, thank you. I also would like to abstain on this one. Okay, thank you for expressing your views. I respect them and uh, wish you uh, success on your journey with your advisors. And I hope it's a peaceful resolution for you. Um, does anyone else want to make a statement regarding this? If not, then I guess we will once again have the vote. I think the vote is now having Region Atwal and Region Cologne abstaining, correct? Okay, so once again, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. So now, we didn't miss anyone else. Sorry about that, Hector. Um, We'll go to the Education Committee and the report of Regent Bogos. Thank you, Regent President Many Deeds. At our meeting yesterday, the Education Committee accepted the first reading of a revised mission statement, received a presentation, and approved six resolutions. In the first of a two part review and approval process, UW Stout sought a first reading of its re revised mission statement. Chancellor Catherine Frank provided committee members with an overview of both the approval process and contents of the revised mission statement. The campus will seek final approval from the Board of Regents at a future meeting. Accordingly, this agenda item was for informational only. Afterward, Vice President Moravel Sosa delivered an end of year review on the work conducted by the Office of Academic and Student Affairs. We also discussed the conflicts of the religious holiday start date and we will review the, con the current policy to see how we can improve on this as it relates to diversity, inclusivity, and equity. Finally, the committee received an update on the Freshwater Collaborative of Wisconsin from Executive Director, Dr. Marissa Jablonski. The business of the committee also included approval of four new academic degree programs, the June 3rd, 2021 committee meeting 
minutes and one regent policy document. Specifically, action items included approval of a Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts in, in Bioinformatics at UW Eau Claire, Master of Science in Sport Administration at UW Platteville, um, Bachelor or of Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity at UW Whitewater, Master of Science in Marketing at UW Whitewater, and a change to Region Policy Document 412. Academic program planning review and approval in the University of Wisconsin system. Regent President Many Deeds, this concludes my report. There, therefore, I move for adoption by the board resolutions C1 through C5 and resolution E. Thank you. I'm jumping the gun all the time, right? I'll get I'll get the timing soon enough. <laughs> Is there a second, please? Second. Is there any discussion regarding any of the items reported on by Regent Bogus? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you for that report. I think now we have <clears throat> some business. Um, we've received some corrections to the 2021 report on faculty promotions, tenure designations, and other changes of status which the board approved at its last meeting in June. May I have a motion to adopt resolution 11.9, approving the corrected report? A second. Second. Is there any discussion regarding this item? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Now we're gonna have a discussion regarding a proposed region policy on tribal consultation and before we do that, President Thompson and I are going to uh, greet our guests in a traditional way. And like you read it and it's like it's not your words. You're not talking about. Oh. Okay. All right. At this time, on behalf of the Board of Regents and the University of Wisconsin system, it's my honor and privilege to welcome the Native Nations of Wisconsin to our meeting. 
<clears throat> it's my privilege to introduce our guests both in person and virtually as well as recognize the sovereign nations who were not able to attend and join us today. In alphabetical order, we're pleased to recognize Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Brotherton Indian Nation, Forest County Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk Nation, the Kudere Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Lac de Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, Oneida Nation, Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Mole Lake Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, St. Croix Chippewa Indians of Wisconsin, Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians. Our guests today include representatives of Ho Chunk Nation, Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, Oneida Nation, Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, St. Croix Chippewa Indians of Wisconsin, and Brotherton Indian Nation. Would you please introduce yourselves to the board? Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Um, hi, Nipi. My name is Nihoma Thundercloud. I'm from the Ho Chunk Nation Education Department as the Executive Director. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Um, I know that you're all you're all big leaders in your own uh, in your own right. Basically, uh, state of Wisconsin societal plenipotentiaries. Like they say at the United Nations, and I guess we are kind of like a little uh, uh, a collection of United Nations. Uh, I know some of you are Polish, some of you are English, uh, some of you are Czechoslovakian, uh, some of you are Russian. Uh, uh, I don't see any Afghanis in here. I guess they're uh, pretty busy in, uh, dealing with their own problems over there, uh, just like we're dealing with our own problems over here. But anyway, my name is Jeremy Patrick Rockman, Kunu Mongskahiga, which means white breast of a black bear. <clears throat> I'm a combat veteran of the United States Marine Corps, First Marine Division, 1968-69. I was an O351 anti-tank assault man and uh, commanding officer's machine gun team got blown up by an old French landmine coming out of Quezon. Three days later, I became a machine gun team leader, even though that's not my MOS. But they knew that uh, I was a capable individual. I can carry whatever burden uh, that was in, in, imposed upon me. And so that's how I left uh, 1st Marine Division uh, up in the DMZ along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I just want to say that to you because of the fact that everyone in here had someone that, that was probably associated with the Vietnam War. And so in that, in that regard, uh, you consider me to be essentially an, an equal to all of those, your loved ones, that, that went down that war path. And I'm uh, the executive compliance officer of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Ho-Chunk was Ijechi Ho-Wachina. And um, I know that uh, some of your concerns and considerations here today re relate to uh, the, the issue of Native American education. And I'll be happy to involve myself in whatever capacity that I can, because I have both the bachelor's degree, UW Eau Claire, 1970, master of arts degree in ed sec, special ed psychoeducational studies from University of uh, Minnesota and Minneapolis. <clears throat> and Doctor of Education degree in Administrative and Policy Studies in Education with a minor in Curriculum and the Study of Schooling from the University of California at Los Angeles in 1990. And I'm 77 years old, and I hold the Class B state record for the 120-yard high hurdles 
in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> so I'm top notch. I know it. <laughs> and I'll tell anybody that I'm top top notch because check the records. There I am. <laughs> and um, I don't like to speak too boldly. People might think that I'm audacious, which I'm not. I'm basically uh, in my own tribe and my own family. I'm basically just a down to earth kind of an individual. But I like action and. This entire board of uh, regents that's congregated here, uh, you're all dedicated to positive action. And if you're dedicated to positive action, well, then you find me a, a, an amiable, cordial, and productive uh, partner in whatever your pursuits may be. And I wish you all a, a, a happy day on behalf of the Ho Chunk Nation that I'm uh, representing here today along with our education director, Nehoma Thunderclock. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So please talk wait. Lokats, Nukyats, Niwagita Loda, Unyot Aga, Niwajoda. My name is Brandon Yellowbird Stevens. I'm the vice chairman for United Nation of Wisconsin. I'm also the president of the Board of Regents for the Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas, one of two uh, federally ran universities, uh, tribal only. Uh, campuses on uh, in the US. And so um, greetings, Governor Thompson, President, many deeds and Board of Regents. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Oneida Nation. Thank you. Thank you. Also, also Chairman Gunnar Peters, nominee Indian Tribal Wisconsin. I thank you um, in our language, we say Waiwanan for allowing me to come and speak on behalf of the board here and also reaching out to Governor Tommy Thompson and President Many Deeds. You know, it's a great honor to come and speak to this board to offer, you know, what we see as a start of a process of tribal consultation. So again, it's an honor to be here in front of you to speak. So again, why when in, in our language, so. Well, it's our honor to have you here uh, as representatives of some of the 12 nations spread through Wisconsin. As a state public university, the University of Wisconsin system has an obligation to serve each nation to its fullest capacity, recognizing that each nation has its own unique needs. Did I miss someone introducing? Thank you. Sometimes I miss things and she just has to remind me. Anyway, each nation has its own unique needs. Coordination and collaboration between the university and tribal, state, and local governments is vitally important. Our main goal is to better serve Native students in their communities. And we invited you here today to help us, to give us direction, to have us benefit from your knowledge, your experience in working with your young people to helping them get educated, to want to come, to be able to help us keep them, and to be able to help us graduate them so that they can go on to lead productive lives uh, as we all wish we can. We're honored here to have you help with us consult on this consultation policy. And as I said, this consultation policy is one that we want you to help us with. We want you to Tell us uh, what is necessary to start this first step in this process. So thank you very much. I know President Thompson has a few words to say. So President Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, President Menendez. And on behalf of, of the administration, I would just like to say thank you for coming. Uh, this is uh, something that is very near and dear to my heart and to the board's heart. We want to reach out much more so than we've ever had before. We want to encourage as many Native American young men and women, middle-aged, elderly as we possibly can, to avail yourselves of the wonderful university system that we have. And we want to work with you, as President Menendez has said, in the consultative process to determine what sort of courses might benefit 
more individuals from the Indian nations that are in this room today and are watching on the screen behind us. We want to find out how we can possibly come up with the necessary scholarships, the necessary assistance, and also when we are able to get Native American to come to our universities, how we can better serve them while they're here. We not only want to educate them, we want to be their partners and develop a way for life's path to be able to be the best possible. And we're extending our hands, our tobacco ceremony that we just gone through as a sense of humility, honor, dedication, and friendship. And so please take it to heart. I know uh, most of the thunderclouds in the Ho-Chunk nations have been in their homes and met them, and it's so good to see you again. And I believe that Chancellor uh, Dennis <coughs> and I are gonna, from Platteville, are gonna be with you next Friday in Wisconsin Dells and talking about potential courses. So thank all of you for being here, and let's hope that this today's event is the start, a giant step forward for the future of cooperation and a partnership of the Native American nations and the Board of Trustees and Board of Regents for the university system. Thank you. I believe that I missed some people that are appearing by WebEx uh, and uh, did not allow them to introduce themselves. Could you please identify yourself uh, for us today? Jessica, I'll defer to you first. Okay. Okay, can you okay, hear me? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. I'm like that Verizon commercial. <laughs> Uh, good morning to each of you. Uh, my name is Jessica Ryan, and I am a member of the Brother Town Indian Nation. Uh, my family line is primarily the Ski Sucks, um, but I do have relations that extend through many other um, lines within our community. I'm grateful to be here today. I have um, the responsibility within my community as the vice chair for the Brother Town Indian Nation. Um, as many of you know, our tribe is um, not yet uh, regained the federal recognition status, and that is something that continues to be important to us. And we are grateful to be included with the other tribes um, that are here meeting with you in a good way and with a good heart today. Very grateful for the, uh, the way in which you are approaching this. And I can't, um, can't say that strongly enough, that it's really important what you're doing, and I'm grateful that you're doing it in that way. So. Grateful to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Shannon Holsey, and I am the president of the Stafford Chumasi community. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And um, much like Vice President Ryan had said, um, it's I it, I really feel humbled to be among such um, great tribal leaders and forward-thinking um, educators this morning. Uh, I especially thank. Um, President um, Many Deeds and former Governor Thompson, and in his respective role as Chancellor. Um, I do concur with my colleagues, and I don't agree. I, I was so thankful I didn't have to go behind our esteemed elder of Ho Chunk Nation because he is he is not, <laughs> he is certainly not bodacious. He's amazing. And I'm just so incredibly excited to be there. Um, I also serve as the uh, president of the Great Lakes Intertribal Council, which represents the 11 tribal nations on all matters, including educational matters with regards to our citizens, as well as I serve as the National Congress of American Indians treasurer. Um, so I, I, I concur with the way and the manner in which we are going about this in a good way. And I also concur with one of my, uh, just somebody that I, I revere so highly, uh, Wilma, Wilma uh, Mankiller, when she said, whoever controls the education of our, future, of our children controls our future. And I think that's incredibly true. And I think it's not enough to just provide resources 
in terms of people coming to into UW Madison or the UW system. We also we also have to set a system up in place that supports them in their academic endeavors, so that we succeed in bringing that knowledge um, both his both educationally and institutionally and culturally back to our tribal nations, because there is always that balance. So, you know, and everything that we do, it's in, in encompassed our culture, our language, and our traditions. And then, you know, on the other side of it is, is how do you balance that with education in order to advance the needs of your tribal communities? And it, um, I'm a full, a full believer and proponent of education, both formally and informally. Um, I, I too hold multiple degrees, but I think the, the best education I ever had gotten is by engaging in colleagues such as the ones that are there today, both virtually and in person, and of course, by, led by people like yourself. And so I'm incredibly excited and humbled to be here, and I am hopeful that we can come to uh, in a good way. And it, this is just the start of that robust conversation we have to have. And the fact that there is the use of language of formalizing how we're going to go about that in terms of prioritizing and then creating that platform of, of consultation is very meaningful to us. So thank you very much, and Anisha. All right, well, I think it's, I think it's my turn up here next. Uh, uh, Bonjour, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is uh, Jared Blanche. I am the Director of Education for the Reclive Tribe of Lake Superior Chippewa. Um, I, I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to be here to represent our tribe, our people. As a little quick uh, story I want to kind of bring up for us to kind of keep our mind while we're talking today. Um, when I graduated from our local school district, I was able to go with a few friends to the UW Superior System, where there's a group of us around, around eight of us. Um, after four or five years, I was the only one to graduate there um, due to many issues. Some folks had issues with home, some folks had issues where they want to transfer somewhere else, and then they dropped off somewhere here or there. Since then, I've been able to teach in several school districts. I've been able to get this job position back home, bring what I've experienced out in the world back to my home community. And one thing that I see a lot here is um, I do a lot of scholarship work, work with a lot of schools and a lot of students to work and get to different schools and uh, go place to achieve their dreams. And one thing I see is folks going in there for a year and then taking a break from one reason or another and then never going back in there. Um, some of these are family things that we can't avoid, but also I believe some of them are, are issues of our, our students not feeling comfortable being that far away from home. So I want us to kind of keep that in mind while we're talking with these, these issues today is how can we make this system, how can we make these schools, this community is more inviting for our native youth, our native people to be a part of this and want to be uh, there and feel welcome. I think that's probably the biggest thing that I see and what gets brought up a lot to me when folks want to apply for school. They're very scared to go far out there, away from their bubble, away from their family. And that happens a lot for folks, just they, they get a bad experience out there due to it was other students, uh, possibly even faculty, possibly other things that are out of anyone's control. But I think if we can create a better environment for these students, they'll have a much better experience in our UW system. So Miigwech everyone, thank you. And uh, I'll be here in and out today. So have a great day, Miigwech. there was an initiative called the Native Nations UW Working Group. And uh, there were a group that got together and had listening sessions with different groups and they developed a list of priorities and strategies. And uh, they came up with some recommendations. And one of those was to hire a uh, first ever Native American Student Success Coordinator. And I'd like her to talk about the uh, memorandum of understanding that uh, was another recommendation that that group had and she'll be doing that in a moment but first i'd like governor thompson to tell you a little bit about that i, I think we should listen to uh, dr jennings she's uh, uh she's dr jennings is a member of the <clears throat> menominee tribe and uh, it's just an awesome uh, uh, individual that has helped uh, me considerably and helped the university, and she has been 
meeting with the <clears throat> many of the tribes and has done the heavy lifting and developing the consultative agreement uh, to where it is today. So I think uh, uh, I think we should hear from Dr. Jennings, uh, President Minnie. She is uh, uh, very capable and has done an outstanding job. And, and I just have the utmost respect for her ability, her leadership, and what she's developed so far. Thank you very much, President Thompson. Dr. Jennings, the floor is yours. All right. Hoso Maunuiak, Nuis Wen Sasane Sa Jennings. So I appreciate um, all of our tribal leaders using their native language. This wasn't a place where we were able to do that. So the little that I know, I try to use it. So why went in for, for doing that? Why went in for being here? Um, I got a little emotional watching the giving of tobacco because I don't know if that's ever done. So really thank you all for your leadership and, and being here. Thank you. Um, Regent Pre President Many Deeds, as well as President Thompson, for allowing us to have for allowing us to have this conversation today. Um, so a little bit about um, the MOU that happened between UW Madison and Native Nations in Wisconsin. Um, prior to me starting these slides, um, UW Madison had a Native Nations group that started, um, and what they did is they met with um, all of the nations in in Wisconsin some years now, um, and so. One of the things that they asked for was a tribal consultation policy, as well as a um, position um, at system to help the system administration be able to move forward um, some, some of these things. And so, hence my position came along. Um, and so, um, and then uh, actual tribal consultation policy. So what we're thinking about right now and what we're wanting to discuss is something system wide. So really want our, um, our institutions to think about them, but Right now, you know, moving forward a system wide uh, policy um, to help them think about consultation. So that that's a little bit about where we got here. Um, a little bit about me, some context. So I um, born and raised on Menominee Reservation. Um, went to school at UW Madison, got my master's and my bachelor's degree there, and then I went to University of Minnesota and got my PhD there. Um, this job came back and I thought it came up and I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to help serve our nations as well as, you know, do the work um, and, and help our, our native students really succeed in, in UW system. So that's kind of some context. Currently, I work um, and in the equity, diversity and inclusion office um, with um, Dr. Warren Anderson. So that's where my position sits right now um, and really been thankful to, to all the leadership um, previous and um, Ray, President Ray Cross, as well as um, all his staff members, because he's also helped get us here where we we are now. So I want to also put that out there. Um, you can you can put up the slides when when ready. So so this is just a brief brief overview. Um, it's not necessarily set in stone. It's just something to familiarize people who may not be familiar with tribal consultation and give you an idea, particularly through an education lens um, of, of what we're thinking about doing. And then just some context around um, the you know, University of Wisconsin system and, and how, we, um, how we are enrolling our students, what our graduation rates are looking like and that sort of thing. So um, next slide. So really want to start off. Um, this is something I would love to <laughs> to consult on with with our tribal leaders, but I thought we would be remiss by not doing that. Um, so I kind of wrote this up quickly. Again, um, this is not set in stone, but this is something that, that we really need to think about, right? When we're we're honoring and recognizing our nations who have been here um, and are currently here, right? And what that looks like. So I'll, I'll read it, read it off. Um, again, this is not our an official statement, but I thought we needed to do that um, to honor, honor our nations here um, today. So the native population in Wisconsin dates back centuries. Their presence in this state long predates Wisconsin statehood and the University of Wisconsin system. These native nations have fought to maintain their sovereignty and self-determination in the face of federal policies of assimilation, allotment, and termination. Present day Wisconsin is home to 12 native nations, each with unique identities, heritage, strengths, and needs. They are geographically located near one of the 13 four-year UW universities and or one of the 13 branch campuses. The University of Wisconsin system administration respects the inherent sovereignty of these native nations who call Wisconsin home. Next slide. 
So briefly, right, briefly today, um, really want to reflect on what it means to have a tribal consultation policy in the education context, um, explore the steps that we need to get there. So, you know, having our tribal leaders at the table is, is crucial and, you know, we hope to get everybody here um, to have this conversation to, you know, because everybody, we're all, all different within, within our nations and we recognize that. Um, discuss the benefits of, of having a policy between the nations and the system and, and think about and engage um, leadership conversations to help think about how we're going to implement this process moving forward. Next slide. So just, just, you know, to all be on the same page, um, you know, tribal consultation is really just this really enhanced form of communication. I think, you know, that emphasizes trust, respect, and I think shared responsibility. So being co-collaborators in this endeavor, um, whether we're talking about enrollment or we're talking about um, business operations or we're talking about, you know, NEGPRA kind of concerns that we may have on our campuses, uh, we need to be able to have this type of relationship built uh, between our government to government um, relations. So next slide. Some of the, the guiding principles, um, again, not set in stone, but something that we, we really wanted to start off with and thinking about. Um, we want to, we want everybody to know that, you know, the University of Wisconsin system recognizes and respects the authority of the sovereign nations and, and committed to this relationship with, with the individual sovereign native, native nations of the state. Again, recognizing that they're all very different um, and wanting to make sure we, we respect and honor that. And, and most importantly, honoring the culture, traditions, beliefs, and government processes, codes, regulations of each nation, right? We want to make sure that, again, we're honoring, we're honoring the individuality of each nation um, that come to the table and really thinking about how we can work together for, for our, our future students and our current students. Next slide. So just two, two brief slides, really just thinking about <laughs> what, what our current context is here in the UW system. So if you see the map on the left hand side, the red um, kind of outlines are where our native nations kind of, you know, are presently located. Um, just so if you have an idea, <laughs> right, of what, what, where they are, where they, where are they are connected to our UW campuses um, and the shaded um, green and yellow um, are really population, um, the population of, of the native people in that area. So just giving you an idea of, you know, we do have a good number of native people in Wisconsin. <laughs> and so, you know, as a UW system, really thinking about how we engage the, that population across. And, and to give you, and also an idea of, you know, not all of our students are located or future students are located on these reservations. They are also located in urban spaces. So we think about Milwaukee, we think about Madison. Um, we also think about our suburban um, students. So, you know, we're not just solely focused on reservations, but we need to think about Wisconsin as a whole and where all of our students are and what that commitment looks like across, across our state. And so, the, the graph on the right is really showing our current system enrollment. So um, as of right right now, um, we have around 2000 undergrad and graduate students who are enrolled in, in UW system. And then you just see that compared to um, the population age between 18 and 34, just to give you an idea of, of what that looks like. So next slide. And these numbers, again, are just some trend data um, over 10 years or so. So thinking about, you know, what, what, are we, what are we dealing with? What are we working with when we're thinking about enrollment, graduation, and employment? And so we stay steady at about 2,000 Native students um, enrolled in, in UW system, which is, is about 1.7% of Wisconsin resident enrollment. And, and we only have a Wisconsin resident enrollment, so we may have other numbers, um, which includes non non residents. So just want to give you that clarifying um, factor around that. Um, we also have graduation rates, which you know students are graduation about fifty percent within um, six years. So thank you, Jared, for sharing your story. <laughs> I think you know it really, it really amplifies some of the things that we're talking about in, in that number here, um, compared to the sixty-eight percent of Wisconsin resident students, which is a little bit lower. Um, so thinking about how we can work to to increase that. Um, 
the actual number of undergraduate degrees um, that we've awarded. Um, and then on the employment side, you know, it decreased a little bit. Um, we had about around 200 to 140. So um, of, of all system employees who um, identify as of native native um, background. And this is self identification too. So we have to keep that in mind and what that what that looks like. So just, just the brief context, we could talk more all day, I bet, about, about these statistics, but wanted to give you an understanding of kind of what we're working with right now. Next slide, please. So thinking about, you know, the foundation of tribal consultation, again, um, the, the leaders in the, the room are definitely experts. They've been working with state agencies um, for years on what this looks like. And so we want to make sure as, as an education system that we want to get this, this, this right and working with you all in a good way. Um, so one of the things is just relationship building, right? You being here is huge. Us going to you, having conversations, um, keeping that leader to leader communication open, identifying priorities and sticking to those and having regular meetings and conversations, identifying point people within your community, because we know that education is a small um, area of which you're running, right? You're running nations. And so we wanna make sure that we also are being respectful um, of the other things that you could be doing today. So I also appreciate you all spending time with us today and having this conversation. Um, engagement, so having that open, open, honest, and regular communication. And I think, you know, for me, really importantly is consultation across all contexts. So, you know, not just enrollment, not just the business operations, but everything that we particularly think of that would affect um, our Native nations, the students that are coming from your communities. Um, and working in collaboration, right? You know, you need, we need to be able to work in collaboration and, and say, what is what do we deem successful for our native students and what does it look like? And so, you know, not not one telling the other what, what we're supposed to do, but be really being um, co collaborate co collaborators in this endeavor. Next slide, please. And so just brief next steps. Again, this this could look different. You know, I've, I have my notes ready <laughs> to, to really think about how we move forward because I want to take the expertise in the room. Um, but continuing to consult the Native Nations and tribal leaders, um, it, it's been a little tough with, with COVID. And so, you know, I do appreciate the folks that we have been in communication with, and we're still, we're still really um, wanting to meet with you all after this individually um, to talk about your, your thoughts, your recommendations, where you see this going, um, working towards in building our campus capacity, right? having them trained, um, identifying where they need resources to, to do their own consultation policies, because we recognize each, each institution is a little bit different. So we wanna make sure that we give them and provide them the capacity to do so and determine where UW system consultation can be improved. Um, you know, we, we know this is, we're just, this is our first go at it. So we, we recognize that we, we could have done this in the in the past, and so we want to make sure we we improve those efforts looking going forward, and then establishing a timeline um, and and approving a formal consultation policy. And, and so, next slide. So that's a brief brief presentation, um, a kind of an overview foundation of this, the discussion that we're that President um, Many Deeds will lead. Um, I'll be here for questions. Again, I'm I'm always here to, for um, the Native Nations. If you have questions, um, any any of the leadership in a room, um, that's kind of where I see myself. I sit in between you all. So if you do have questions or concerns or need to reach out, my information is right there. And thank you for providing me some time to um, talk about this this very important work. recognize your commitment and all the hard work that you have put into this uh, policy and the discussion today and your groundwork. And I know you're going to keep doing that until we get everyone uh, to give us their input. I would like to remind the regents and others that this proposed policy presents a vision and a commitment for the board and the system for a general framework for future action. But the main goal is to consult with people that can give us information about how to get our Native students here, one, how to keep them here, two, and then three, how to graduate them. 
and you're the experts. You have all the answers, I hope, because we don't have any. We've obviously not done a good job uh, in Wisconsin. It's the statistics are make me very sad. Um, I I want to have those statistics be something that we can really be proud of, and I want our students, if they wish, to be educated uh, in any field that they would like to be involved in. And I know that President Thompson has joined me in this wish and desire to see us be successful. I, I think that that is the main goal of this consultation policy, to make sure that we can get your input, your expertise, your knowledge, your assistance, your guidance, and anything else that you can provide us with to help the campuses who, who we will, by this policy, direct to talk to you, to find out from your parents about what we can do to make the something that they're not having bad experiences at, that they're not unhappy at, that they're going to and just can have a normal uh, student experience and learn something and graduate. That's what I think this policy represents. Uh, and I think it's been drafted in such a broad way that sometimes we can forget about or not see that the main goal is to get people educated and to find out from you how we can do that. So I just wanted to say that uh, I want us to all work together to achieve that goal. So with that, I'd like to know if anybody has any questions, and I'd like to hear from our experts about their students and what we can do to to help this process be successful for all of us. So anyone, Regent Bogus. Um, thank you, President Many Deeds. Um, I just first want to say how honored and privileged we are to have so many represent re representatives from the Native Nations. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that we are all very, very privileged to be on your land and we are very, very grateful that we were able to do so. So thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Jennings for the wonderful report. Um, I just, I, I have a question, but I also wanted to, to just follow up on President Many Deeds, what you said and how we can do so much better. And we're so grateful to be able to collaborate with all of you. Um, and it's, it's, uh, tribal consultation policy is not a unique thing, as we all know. Um, I know many of the um, the state agencies have it, but it's also uh, different when it comes to UW system. I know that University of Arizona system has one as of 2016. So um, we're a bit late to the game, but we're, we really want to do our best and um, we want to work really hard with all of you to succeed in this effort. Um, and I, I know the Department of Education, the Federal Department of Education started way back in 2009 um, with having a, a federal policy. So I'm really looking forward to this. And I, I was hoping that because it is um, a big concept that perhaps Dr. Jennings, maybe you could just explain um, how it is a, a tribal consultation policy and what we've set forth and help to really work with and collaborate with all nations. Um, how is that different from maybe some of us are familiar with the agencies in this state, how it is different when you have it at a UW or university system as opposed to state agencies? Um, yeah, thank, thank you for um, your question. Um, we, so it's a little bit different in that um, we, are really just it's most of, it's an umbrella policy that's really allowing our institutions to consult in the ways that they need to. So it's a little bit different than that. I think state and I'm not an expert on state agencies, but you know that state agencies can, can consult initially and then have their departments kind of move forward how they need to. And so this this policy is really just allowing for those um, institutions for us as a system, um, as, as you all as the Board of Regents to, to consult, right? Just to say we need to consult on these very important matters. Um, it doesn't, you know, necessarily say how or when, and that's the part of the actual consultation. And so really just thinking about this policy is, is the step before actual consultation. And so making sure that 
you know, we, we set ourselves up as, as a system to be able to move this forward um, and say, hey, you know, um, you have this, this concern or this issue, you, you need to consult in, in a good way and you need to figure out how to do that. So that's a, it's a little bit different. So I appreciate you bringing up um, the, the, the difference and, and really thinking about how we can move forward. Um, and that's where, you know, our tribal leaders and, and you all as, as educators um, to help us understand how we can do that. So, um, so it's, it's, again, yeah, it operates a little bit different and I think that maybe we all were, were recognizing it to be. Um, and so really just thinking about how we can help our institutions and ourselves um, figure out how to just to just consult, just just consult. And then, you know, we can figure out how to move forward in that way. Your comments. I know. Mr. President. I do. I'd like to uh, also uh, give a, a bit of tribute to our provost because uh, the provost and all the all the campuses, along with the chancellor, of course, uh, came together in 2016, and the provost uh, really started this ball rolling and, uh, with the UW Extension collectively. They authorized the initiative, which is ending up today with the consultative process, and of course, uh, Dr. Jennings uh, uh, helped to formulate that, and I believe. Dr. Jennings, you had something like 16 uh, meetings around around the state. Don't exactly know uh, you, uh, along with a lot of other individuals. So, on behalf of the university, thank you, Dr. Jennings, and thank the provost and the chancellor, and of course the board, and especially the tribal chairman and their representatives from the 12 Indian nations to come here today and to discuss the matter. So. Half of myself personally, I would just like to say thank you. And to the provost, the chancellor, Dr. Jennings, thank you all. Does so Chairman Halsey have a question? Just to, just just to, to, follow, just to follow up. Um, I appreciate that, and I think what consultation also serves is in a foundational capacity, you know, because much like any other system, tribal nations, they're, we're seeking continuity and consistency as we move forward in these endeavors. Um, we are all elected officials, so the continuity comes in to the engagement of consultations. So whatever it is, it's codified in a formal way. So whoever precedes us, or if there's a change of government or whatever, much like any other democratic process, you you have foundationally built upon things because you that's the risk you take when you don't formalize things or at least um, engage in such a way that there is some structure because. That that's always the risk of that. So that's why I think that we that this is a large part of how we're going to memorialize some of these things and move forward. And as my former tribal president used to say, uh, no decisions about us without us. And I think that's really what consultation really is in its truest, simplest form. So I do appreciate it. And again, to my peers and my colleagues with me today, um, you really have the best of the best in terms of people coming forward to present. I, I travel nations putting their best people forward to help guide these these uh, this consultation policy and how we're going to move forward. But ultimately, I think the goal is much the same. There's parity and equity in the same that much like you're endeavoring to find success um, in in bringing uh, Native American students into your system and help them succeed, the same goal is true that of tribal nations. So thank you. Do you have any other statements? I know many of our chancellors have done a good job of on this area, and 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 um, our comments here today are not to lessen those efforts, but to encourage them and to to ask. If you haven't done so to to include by looking at this policy in ways that are necessary, the tribes that that are in your area, or perhaps in the entire state to help you come up with. Ways to recruit, keep and graduate our students and and uh, this broad, broad policy gives you a framework uh, to build from uh, it's not uh, it's not the. The Holy grail of guides It's just a framework so. Uh, I know you all endeavor to do those things, uh, but we're asking for more because this this issue requires more attention than it has ever received in the past. Uh, I uh, I know that we all 
want to see this be our students be successful and particularly those students that have not been uh, had attention paid to them in the past historically and that is going to stop and i know you're all with me on that i know the board's with me on that and i know we are going to hear more about how we can collaborate and and what you need to tell us about what needs to be in this policy if you need something else we want to hear that we can change redraft make things a little different so that it's clear that the intent is for us to listen to uh, be educated on how to successfully get students we know how to instruct but we obviously in this area don't know how to attract keep and graduate so that's what the purpose is from my perspective does anyone else have a question for dr jennings or would like to make a statement of any kind region vice president Walsh. thank you president many deeds uh, again i want to reiterate the thanks uh, of myself and the entire board for your appearance here today um, there, there's one particular population within the Native American community in Wisconsin that I would be particularly interested in connecting with. And as the gentleman who's on screen mentioned, there are a number of people who may have started their education and didn't complete it. Can you help us connect with those people and learn more about why they, uh, why they left their education um, unfinished? Uh, Buju, this is Jared Blanche again. Um, if it's okay, I might just speak a little bit candidly about some experiences that that I know from students I've worked with, friends I went to school with. There's just a lot of many conflicting things that might be a part of what this is. Um, just in my own experience, again, going back to it, um, uh, we are from a very small nation up at the very top of Wisconsin. Uh, Reckliff is probably one of, one of the smallest ones. Um, so graduating from our local school district here, um, we actually have a public school just south of Reckliff itself. That is the Bayfield school system. Bayfield is a public school, but it does have 85% students from Reckliff attending. So that makes up a majority of what it is. So when us, our class, our students go on to the UW system, a lot of times it can be a bit of a culture shock to them. Um, when I went to school there, there was a a great kind of um, sort of a, a, a native student club at the UW Superior System, which helped out a lot. There was the the recently recently passed away uh, Gary Johnson. He was ahead of that, and he kind of created a very welcoming environment that I was able to be a part of, and you know made me feel like there's a place where I could go to if I need help. Um, I was always kind of academically on the ball with stuff. I could always kind of adapt to what was asked of me. I had some friends, though, who just couldn't adapt to what was being asked of them. They would spend all day studying, and then they would go to their their test at the end of the day, and they'd, they'd, they'd fail it. They'd have no idea why it is. Um, when they look at me, and I just you know, kind of flip through the book, like, yeah, that sounds like a good answer, and I pass with a B or something like that. So you know, not again, not definitely not to toot my own horn, but that's just kind of what an experience was where I see this person struggling so hard. It just wasn't wasn't her learning style, wasn't her teaching style, wasn't her the way she expressed what she learned in that class. Um, thankfully, she was one of the folks that I know that did graduate. Uh, she actually has her master's degree now. She she went way above and beyond. But like I said, a, a, a group of folks that went with me to that school, every one of them dropped out otherwise where there was going back home to to help out their family whether it was they went they wanted more partying so they went to a different uh, school and then they worked out over there only to come on back home years and later with a lot of debt and a lot of regrets um, some folks that went to school with me made it to the last semester and then something happened to them uh, mental health wise or just being burnt out stressed out and I can't even imagine the kids had to work work through COVID, the experience they had to go through. Um, just that, just it's so strange. Not saying I could even connect with. 
but and that was just the experience of, of my own school and education from since then i've been working with folks who go to school um, who want to go out and do things on their own who want to go from our little itty bitty blip of redcliffe to down in wisconsin even out further to like california to florida we have some students who are flourishing out there they're having a great time uh, one student down in florida has been down there for the past three years he could be graduating this year and then we have some folks who graduate their their top marks of our local school district then they go down to a uw school or any other school in wisconsin and then they just don't feel that same kind of comfort that same kind of acceptance um i've heard stories of just teachers kind of put them on the spot in weird and negative ways and you know, again, going back to my experience, um, there's a very, very well-meaning teacher. She's actually one of my favorite okay. teachers that I worked with in my UW experience. But then one day we were going for um, connecting with uh, ancient cultures that she, she considered it. So all of a sudden I went to Native American cultures and all of a sudden I was on the spot saying, oh, hey, Jared, you wanna share anything of your experience? And I, you know, sheepishly shared what, how I grew up, what culture I knew and, and even though it was a very, very well-meaning thing, I really do believe that it just made me feel excluded because I wasn't part of the other class. And I know many other folks that I work with where they're um, graduates themselves or students I work with, they've had experience like that in the past as well, where all of a sudden the spotlight was on them because they were the one Indian in, in class. But again, I don't think that was, I don't think there's any ill will in that, but, it's just that kind of the experience that a lot of our folks have to deal with being looked at as the other person in the room that what doesn't quite match what the rest of the others experience and looks might be a little bit of an off topic i do know that there was a program which had something kind of similar to the native club that i had in uw superior there's a few other clubs around there in different schools but i do know that there was one school i think down further south that had a kind of elder that was they're present to kind of assist any students going to the school or having any questions about culture or any questions about just how to how to be in that bigger wider world i know a lot of our folks coming from the reservation going to schools again like i mentioned it's a bit of a of a shell shock definitely definitely a bit different experience to have all these stores all these bars all these different people all these different groups and that can be too much for them and that's why I think a lot of folks do end up coming home because it just wasn't what they were expecting, wasn't what was in their, their their comfort zone. But again, that is not everyone's experience. Many folks go out there and they flourish. Like I mentioned, the, the student down in Florida, I have some people over in California, over in Colorado, Washington. So it is definitely comes down to everyone's personal experience, <clears throat> but there are some system levels that I think can be changed and make things more opening and just inviting for our students who are going out of their own shell you know th those students that might not be as active might not be as um uh, extroverted so that's some stuff that i'm kind of looking at and i and i do see our uw a native group and our folks here are all working towards creating some improvements on on that way so it's just some experience that I have and what I know of some folks in our UW system. So make which for giving me some more time to, to speak a little bit. Much work to do and we're so grateful for your partnership. Uh, excuse me. I, I just wanted to add um, for some student you could ask like, what are some of the reasons? Uh, from personal experience, and I know of some of the students that we mentor and, and advise through their journey, um, mental health is a big one. So, um, and even those who do reach out to professionals at you know the schools that the schools provide, um, you know some of those counselors just aren't um, culturally sensitive to some of the issues. And by the time you explain you know all the background of what you're feeling, I mean it's like okay, I'm educating you. Um, and that's that's another thing. Uh, being on campus and seeing things that you know are kind of shock us and or shock me, um, you know, really felt the need to change some of those things. 
So having, you know, protests or writing letters to, you know, leadership and doing this, the stuff that I would think educators would be aware of, um, but obviously not. And so having to fill that, that void and being um, an, a self-advocate. And that's kind of one of the things we express to our students is that they need to be a self-advocate, you know, talk to the professors and all that. But we also stress to them that it's not their job to teach their professors. It's not their job to teach, um, you know, the people in leadership. It's their job to reach out and to learn, not from the students, but from other, um, the tribes or, or other advocates for them. Um, so that's why I'm really excited about this. Uh, but, you know, other things um, for myself, you know, graduating, you know, top 10% of my, my local, my local school in Black River Falls. Um, I did want to go to Madison, but my dad was worried for me because we did have relatives attend here, but that didn't finish. And so he always, you know, said, you know, maybe, maybe Madison or Lacrosse Cross or Eau Claire are too close because he would always see those people, you know, being homesick and then, you know, coming home um, early on a Friday and just, you know, he'd see him again on Monday and just like, you know, it just got to be so much that, you know, they just didn't go back to school. So um, for me, finding a school that was a good fit, um, I, I attended Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. And at the time they had the best, one of the only um, Native American programs in the country, and it was very successful. Um, I graduated in 97. Uh, actually, I took four and a half years, so not the regular four years. I did have, like I said, issues with mental health and um, also learning disability that I didn't know of before. And finding that out only because um, I took an education class in how to teach the ex exceptional child and just learning about some of the things of, you know, students with dyslexia and just like, oh, my God, that's me. So having that opportunity to um, be tested at the university, which I didn't have that opportunity in my local school um, and finding that and making me a better student. So being able to graduate at that level. And then also um, I have a master's in hospitality and tourism from um, UW Stout. So having those opportunities and, and gaining those skills have made me a stronger um, student and also an advocate for my students. And um, hopefully that helps kind of frame some more areas of that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> it's Chairman, I want to, Chairman Peters. Thank you. I want to offer some comments too, and I'm glad that the chancellors are here to um, listen in. Um, and then it's a good topic before we uh, before I give my testimony, but I also want to give some comments on reintroducing the schools to each Native American Na Native American population. I think it's important, and you know we talk about kids dropping out, and it, it does it. <clears throat> it, it. It it's a bothersome. You know, it's to me as a, being a tribal leader that I, uh, you know, we send our kids to school and then a year later they drop out because one, we don't prepare them or the schools don't have programs for them to keep them there. So I think one that I would like to see be brought back is the people program. That was a good program for Native American students to attend because each summer they were allowed to go visit the campus and spend time there and that offered them a scholarship to attend their school of their choice within the UW system. And I know Madison used to have that program. Um, it was offered through the Menominee Indian School District, and we had a, a high attendance for that. So I think reintroducing that people program to the UW schools is vital. And I know we talk about that as trying to increase our Native population in schools, but also making sure that they have programs there to keep Native Americans enrolled in these schools. Um, so that's what I would like to see. Um, and you know, I know others probably will have that in their testimony as well, but you know, those are just my comments that, and I know we always talk about that is trying to increase Native American population. So that's my ask to this board. Thank you. 
I guess I would extend also, you know, just uh, my experience. You know, I went to Carroll College. Um, I was one of two brown faces on campus, and I, you know, I didn't feel included. Um, I lasted a semester, and so I went uh, and eventually went to um, United Tribes Technical College in Bismarck, North Dakota, technical school. Um, uh, tribally operated school. Then I went down to uh, Haskell Indian Nations University um, down in Lawrence, Kansas, and got my MBA at Lakeland College. And so my experiences was there was not a lot of inclusion and, and uh, I felt like an outsider. And, then I, and as a gentleman on, on uh, virtual uh, says, when you're included, you feel excluded or you feel like an anomaly. And, you know, coming from a communal uh, society, there's a lot of weight on your shoulders. And so carrying that weight of, of your family and uh, the lack of familiarity on campus really had uh, an impact, you know, smells, senses. When we come from a communal society, there's the senses that are heightened. And when you're, you feel alone, those senses are heightened in an alert status more so, rather than I have to be more alert of my surroundings because no one's around to protect me. And that sense of security is taken when you're away from your your uh, your family, and I think as my personal experience, that's what I felt going into those institutions that didn't have that familiarity. And I would um, liken the system they have at Arizona State University. They have communal areas for their students that have those that invite other people in. And as long and it, what it helps was as long as the staff faculty all the way down to the custodian to the chancellor understand the impacts and and effects that that have when that's not in place and so it can't be just a place so the indians go in a corner and have their fried bread it's got to be an inclusion across the campus where they feel they feel uh they feel special in their own way but also accepted because everyone knows a little bit about them enough that even if the individual that doesn't know about Native Nations knows enough to know the right questions and understands there's 574 sovereign nations in the US, over 60 state recognized tribes uh, across the nation, to know just a little bit tid facts of what everyone should know and get from uh, primary school and, and, and in elementary school, that is not happening. And when that doesn't happen, we are, as said uh, on virtual, we are teaching the professors on uh, about us, about the responsibility the U.S. government and its residents have to to uh, sovereign nations. And so that's a difficult task when you're when you're 19, 18 years old, coming into that. So I would just, to, from that perspective, understand you know from an 18 year old coming into that, that's a big burden to bear. Thank you. Thank you. I know that Dr. Underly knows that the state or state statutes that indicate that if you're going to be a teacher in Wisconsin unlicensed, that you should be familiar with and have courses in the various nations that are in Wisconsin, know their history, so that you're able to teach the students that you teach in Eau Claire, Stevens Point, Ashland, Wausau, about those groups, those sovereign nations. And it's not uh, something that I believe is enforced, but it is a statute. And uh, I think we we need to emphasize that uh, to maybe help with that along the way. Any other statements? Regent Atwell. I, I'm just very struck by the discussion. I'm especially moved by the stories of Native American kids coming to campus. And I think you just described it uh, beautifully, something, you know, I couldn't, have understood if you hadn't done that or Jared, you know, your explanation of your experience with your with your well meaning professor. And uh, I think without a process like uh, like like Chairman Many Deeds or President Many Deeds that you've initiated here, that we've initiated before before you and, and President Thompson that you've supported, uh, we can't learn and we can't hear the voices. Uh, so even today, while I'm not a teacher on campus, I, I'm just kind of blown away that, wow, we have a lot to learn and to listen. And because uh, I wouldn't have known, you know, and I, I think a lot of our people on campus 
who are well-meaning wouldn't know when am I recognizing the distinctiveness of, of your of your status as tribal members and and trying to honor that and and when is that experienced by you as exclusion so and i don't know another way or a better way to deal with that other than through engagement and through the personal stories that i've heard today so i thank you very much all of you thank you <clears throat> dr rockman do you have anything to add to this I suppose I should say something. <laughs> um, I've listened to everything that, that that all participants have had to say, and uh, well, uh, let me take you back to uh, 1881 Dawes General Allotment and Severalty Act, in which uh, uh, tribal land was uh, was was reduced to uh, 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 160 acres, 80 acres, 40 acres, and and then the, then all of the the uh, so-called surplus land was uh, 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 put up for sale for 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 occupation by non-tribal uh, immigrants and and the, then tribal people went to to schools located on their reservation areas and in 1934 in, in an effort to uh, um, re re remove the vestiges of uh, native consciousness out of uh, native students uh, Congress uh, passed the um, Howard Wheeler Indian Reorganization Act and its companion uh, Johnson O'Malley Act of 1934. And, and uh, according to the, 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 uh, uh, the provisions of uh, Johnson O'Malley Act of 1934, uh, Native uh, youth could uh, uh, go to public schools and the federal government would uh, pay for the uh, bond issues uh, associated with their, their attendance in public schools. And that sounded like a, an, an egalitarian effort in, in, in order to, to, to elevate the educational fortunes of the noble savage. And uh, uh, I, I know some of that experience because I first went to school in 1949 as a, uh, uh, in kindergarten. And, and all that I experienced uh, from uh, uh, kindergarten up to uh, sixth, seventh grade, um, Every time I went out for recess or break to go to the bathroom in, in, in between classes is uh, uh, nothing but bullying. I had two uh, little grandfathers. They were about the same age as me, but uh, uh, according to uh, uh, our uh, relationship reckoning in uh, the, the Ho-Chunk Nation, uh, they, they, they were the, the, the children of, of my uh, my, my uh, paternal grandparent. So they were my little grandfathers. And uh, uh, we, we, we were always being uh, uh, <laughs> depredated upon by non-native uh, students. Every time, get in a fight. Every time, uh, noon hour, uh, in, in, in between uh, 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 classes, and at recess time. So I know the, the, the hard truths, the hard cross-cultural truths of, uh, of going to school in, in those years and, and, uh, and then going even further back when my, my mother went to Nielsville Indian School, um, the, 
uh, they, they were so disappointed and, and so homesick that uh, they they ran away from uh, uh, Nielsville Indian School. My mother and about uh, about four or five others, and one of my uncles was there, and uh, he wanted to go too, but but they told him that he was too small and and that he would uh, imp impede their their attempt to uh, run away from Nielsville Indian School to go back to Wittenberg, Poch Chinunk, uh, village in the forest. That's Wittenberg. And then the original name of Wittenberg is actually Hunchnink um, Hounina. Uh, railroads uh, ran through there and there was a stop at Wittenberg. And the reason why they called it Hunchnink Hounina, Little Bear Station, is because the first uh, 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 Ho Chunk person that they saw get off a uh, train there in, in uh, uh, Wittenberg was a man by the name of Hunchnink. Uh, Little Bear, so they called Wittenberg originally Little Bear Station. That's Winnebago was called it that. And and they, anyway, you know, they they tried to run away back to Wittenberg, but but they were apprehended after they got about five miles. And I think that uh, Wittenberg is uh, probably about 110 miles from uh, from Nielsville. And they, they attempted to go all that way back to, to Wittenberg just to get, a, get away from a, a, the, the educational experience of uh, being in that boarding school. And I know that uh, in, in the annals of Native American history relative to boarding schools, there are all kinds of uh, uh, sad stories, uh, horrendous stories. We, uh, in, in in the recent uh, uh, three weeks or a month, we, we, we've heard about uh, the the, uh, um, the 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 history of uh, the, that Catholic school up in in uh, British Columbia, and 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 all of the uh, dead bodies that uh, were discovered and uh, been been exhumed. Uh, it, uh, in the vicinity of that boarding school. Well, uh, we we native people here, uh, sitting at this table, and the ones that are sitting in those little uh, square uh, cinematic boxes there, at, at trying to be uh, um, uh, the the uh, uh, ne ne next coming of uh, Virginia Mayo and M Marilyn Monroe and, and Charles Bronson. Uh, they have the same kind of stories, same kind of stories. And, and, and the Pope has yet to apologize. He doesn't want to say anything about it because he has a flock of, of millions of people around the world and he doesn't want to go around with egg on his face. So, so I know that about uh, 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 the, the, the historical experience of boarding schools. And the, the Johnson O'Malley Act of 1934. At first, you know, when I read about Johnson O'Malley Act of 1934, I thought to myself, my, that is an egalitarian uh, expression of goodwill toward Native people. But then I came to find out the actualities of uh, Johnson O'Malley Act of 1934 because I went to public schools. And like I said, that's all that I experienced was bullying every every noon hour, at recess time, in between classes. So what what was the Johnson O'Malley Act for? It was for the purpose of us psychologically uh, uh, browbeating of, of native people, and 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 that uh, uh, crushed native people into uh, the, the, those uh, lo lower regions of academic achievement, the dropout problem that, that, that is addressed uh, by those of us who are participating here, either live or, or, or virtually. And I appreciate all the comments that were made by the, the participants virtually and, and, and those of my associates here at the table. And and so essentially what I'm saying is that this body here 
is undertaking a crusade to counteract the uh, negative, destructive effects of institutional racism. I know it's an ugly truth to 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 uh, to to, uh, uh, to to confront by but but by, by a, a group that's just trying to get off the ground, but that's essentially what it is. It's really no different intrinsically from uh, police brutality and black communities. It, it's it, it, it's essentially the, the the same motivations, but only in a different arena. And we are all gladiators in that arena. In, in order for the United States of America to survive, you have to get along with one another. You have to value one another. You have to treasure one another. And, and, and to think that, that, that Native American culture is probably not worth very much, take a look around you and all around the world and see how, how, how valuable uh, the, 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 the culture of uh, exploitation is to the planet that we live on. There is no planet B. This is the only one that we know. And for those fools that think that they're going to go, go ahead and, 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 and specialize in rocket uh, uh, telemetry and, and, and nuclear uh, powered engines uh, to, to uh, uh, cast you way out into the uh, uh, deepest uh, recesses of outer space, you're just fooling yourselves. This society is fooling itself. And maybe that's the reason why we, we, we have unidentified flying objects and, and extraterrestrials and, and aliens in the, in, in the forefront of, of people's minds. When you're walking down a, down a lonely, dimly lit street and you look up at the stars and then you start to think, oh my God, what if E.T. sees me? Maybe E.T. might want something from me. Maybe he might want to go ahead and experiment on me. Maybe he might want to uh, uh, take a part of my body and, and all that will be there is just an incision. People think that way. There's no solution to uh, uh, extraterrestrial visitation. My, my, my own people uh, even uh, uh, make reference to extraterrestrial visitations. And they said that, uh, you know, for, for you to go someplace, an extraterrestrial say, would say, uh, follow in my footsteps, follow in my four footsteps, and you will be gone to a, a far, far away place. Well, I didn't, that, that sounds like ancient aliens to me. Uh, you, you you place your your foot in the the same place where I I step, and next thing you know you're on a craft, and next thing you know you're on on some different world. Well, we're all in the same boat together. We're all one planet, and and and, and if you have a this is essentially an assemblage of United Nations. Native American people are not, uh, we don't have a, a seat at the United Nations. Red people do not have a seat at the United Nations. We have a seat here. Maybe this is, a, this is an, an initial step. And the reason why this planet is, is so far out of kilter and it's being destroyed is because red people have no voice at the United Nations. That's the reason why the Amazon is 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 going going under the, the the lungs of the earth. It's all being destroyed because red people do not have a voice. But here, at least in this assemblage, we have a voice. And and if we re respect our perspectives, respect one another and try and learn. Maybe you won't feel so, so lonely and, and, and cast out into the margins of humanity. 
If we can build a, a fire around which we, we, we can all enjoy one another's company in the presence of uh, Choka Pechokereda, grandfather fire, we'll all be better for it. Maybe in the state of Wisconsin, we can find a way to, to, to uh, uh, pr promote the, the, the ecological systems that yet exist here today instead of cutting everything down. Maybe we can find a way to uh, uh, get, get rid of our Hansel and, and Gretel and Little Red Riding Hood mythologies in, in the re deep recesses of our minds and have some respect for the wolves that, that yet exist here in the state of Wisconsin. I'm a member of the Ho-Chunk Hunch Hiki Karach. Yaki Karach Waunak Shinahena Bear Clan. And our brother clan is the wolf clan. Chunk Chunk Hiki Karachida. And we have a lot of issues that we can discuss. Maybe we can be a political action committee of some renown and have a voice in, in changing things for the better. I don't know just exactly what the, the collective aspirations of this group are. I don't know if everyone here has, has an idea of what our collective aspirations are. But we can all dream big. Thank you, Dr. Rockman. Thank I you. I really appreciate your insight and your the history. And, and now you can see the basis for the uh, lack of trust when someone comes and says, we want to help you. So we have a lot of work to do to restore trust, to have this conversation. So I really appreciate those words. Um, I think... I think that I want to tell everybody that Dr. Jennings is going to continue to work with, with everybody uh, to review and consider the proposed policy that, that we have. And that in the coming months, I hope in the December meeting that we'll have a final version of the consultation policy that will meet the approval of everyone. To conclude this discussion and presentation, President, Thompson and I have some gifts of appreciation to give our guests, and we'll do that now. question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You can give me your own I can also give you that. I think. Well, I'll send you that. But you shouldn't be able to deliver a comment. <clears throat> I have been advised that there is another testimony comment that needs to be heard. 
And so, uh, Vice Chairman Stevens, the United Nations will give us the information he came here to give us. Yeah, I, I just want, I'll defer to Chairman uh, and, and President Holsey. Yeah, I know we, we've come here delegated to deliver a specific testimony specifically to the tribal policy. We were asked a general question on how we felt about a specific topic. And I think uh, for, for, I guess, show of, of uh, good faith effort that I think it's incumbent upon the Board of Regents to listen to our comments regarding the tribal policy. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Chairman Stevens. And again, um, as as duly stated, we were sent here to give specific comments and you know provide certain testimony. So, um, on behalf of Menominee Indian Tribe, I extend my appreciation. You know, this is the first time that I'm I'm aware of as a sitting chair of my tribal nation that we are offered to provide testimony and also um, provide input to a such policy of tribal consultation um, and intera interactions with tribal nations. You know, I see the value of this consultation um, policy being developed and, you know, the commitment and refocus of UW system and, and the schools to engage in meaningful tribal consultation. I'm very proud for the commitment of UW system to reevaluate its protocols, procedures, and policies for tribal consultation their communication and their engagement. I specifically want to thank Dr. Jennings for her commitment and the effort that she is working with all every tribal nation in the state of Wisconsin on this proposed tribal consultation policy and for her research. As well, I want to thank the UW system for inviting me to provide such testimony and also their work to standardize and provide a uniform foundation for this tribal consultation. It's a good draft. It's, it's a step one to the process. And I applaud you. I think what we need to do is we need to see it broaden to actually include education of Native American youth and non traditional students. Some areas that should be included is the recruitment and retention of Native American students. And when I say that, this year alone, we've had from 2021, we've had 20 graduates that have graduated within the UW school systems. Six of them have, have masters. One has a Juris Doctorate degree. That's, we've had 20 students from the Menominee Reservation that have graduated this year alone. That brings our total up to 57 of Menominee tribal members have graduated from the UW system. I think we can do better. We should have a higher number. We should be encouraging every Native American in the state of Wisconsin to attend UW system schools. Also, we need to focus on the recruitment and retention of Native American professors and staff along with their programs, as we have stated earlier in comments. The education of future teachers about the Indian Education Act 31 more, fo more focused on from a Menominee standpoint is language. We need to make sure that we can certify our teachers for their language abilities and get them recognized at a state level. We've had one successful Menominee, young Menominee individual graduate from UW Madison with a degree in ling linguistics, and he is now fluent in Menominee language. I applaud UW Madison. Also recognizing the importance of UW extension to Native American families as stated earlier in previous comments. So I know that the regents are considering moving forward to broaden the consultation scope. UW system should be commended for this. As far as collaboration, we should offer more table in this fashion, bringing tribal leaders to the table in this fashion and getting more input. We get a lot of information in this dialogue. That's what I would like to see moving forward. In my closing remarks, I thank you for 
allowing me to come and speak and also to broaden the scope for the tribal consultation policy. So again, why Wannon? And I'll thank you for allowing me here. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you. Um, um, like to, I want to apologize for making everyone sit here and listen to testimony, but also I understand what it's like on a Wednesday or on a, on a Friday, really nice out uh, to have to you know sit in the meeting. Um, so I'll keep it brief. But I also want to give perspective on why this is here and, and why it's so important. Um, because not only the land acknowledgement that that uh, Dr. Jennings provided in the beginning, it's also put in the perspective that it's not only acknowledging the land you're on, but also acknowledging that it is a privilege for individuals in this room. It's it's an honor, but also it's understanding it's a displacement of tribal tribal lands that the university, the residents, and the city have benefits over in a displacement of tribal nations. And so in perspective, making sure that we understand that in a way that tribal governments and communities have a displacement as well. We have disparities, we have chronic diseases as a result, specifically because of federal government statutes with the intent to displace tribal governments, tribal individuals, and take tribal lands. The Daza Lockman Act was the main one of them. The, the Burke Amendment later on delegated the responsibility to the uh, Secretary of Interior to make sure Indians on allotted land were to be Americanized. And if they weren't able to show that they were Americanized enough, their land was to be taken from them. And so that further displaced tribal members and land ownership. And the tribal uh, land holdings in Oneida Nation up in Green Bay was 65,000 square acres. Because the Dawes Allotment Act and the Burke Amendment, it was whittled down to almost 140 acres. And that's directly impacted by federal government statute with the intention of displacing tribal membership in, in putting settlers in a position of power over tribes. So putting in that perspective, this is why there's, a, there's a, an imminent need for tribal consultations and understanding that we didn't create the issue. The issue is created with the intent and exactly what it meant to do and it's doing its purpose right now. Um, so with, you know, with that opportunity to provide comments you know, on the, the consultation, um, in the last decade, there were approximately 700 Oneidas who attended the UW systems in a little over 200 degrees obtained. So we talk about retention, how can we increase that? There has been 15 associate degrees, 152 bachelor degrees, two health doctorates, 35 master's degrees, one medical degree, three PhDs with approximate cost of $20.9 million to the tribe. Now, the United Nation and University of Wisconsin Green Bay have a long standing relationship uh, with Chancellor Alexander solidified by various programs and partnerships. Both the United Nation and the University of Green Bay communities view this partnership as a foundational relationship that is imperative to joint success as we look forward to continue relationship while expanding our relationship with the UW system. Currently, the, cons the consultation policies direct cabinet agencies to recognize the unique legal relationship between the state of Wisconsin and Indian tribes respect fundamental principles that establish and maintain this relationship and accord tribal governments the same respect accorded to other governmental agencies. We believe all the agencies should have annual consultation meetings with the tribes elected officials to discuss the programs, laws and, fundament, and funding that may affect the tribes as well. The policies are supposed to include steps to mitigate conflicts and disagreements. Additionally, each agency is responsible for notifying the tribes of any changes to the program, laws, or funding as these changes occur. The policy also directs agencies to recognize the unique government-to-government -government relationship between the state of Wisconsin and Indian tribes when formulating and implementing policies or programs that directly affect the tribes and their citizens in whatever feasible and appropriate. Consult the governments of affected tribes regarding the state actions or proposed actions that is anticipated to directly affect Indian tribes or its citizens. While this policy allows to encourage open line of communication between tribes and state agencies, the policies need to be updated. 
uh, uniformed and of all agencies need to be developed, uh, develop, developing policies to meet the tribal nations. The following are recommended goals and revised consultation agreements. One, have a uniformed agreement with all state agencies. Two, create a method of resolving disputes. Three, early and timely consultation with tribes on agency initiatives. Four, increased representation on agency special committees. Five, improved response to issues raised by tribes. Six, development of annual action plans and measure success. To create, and seven, to create appropriate timelines, deadlines for agencies and tribal actions. But also lastly is to create initiatives that have, that you can measure. So broad policy does really good things, but if you don't have specific initiatives to like increase uh, professors, increase staff and faculty within the university systems, it's just a broad policy. We want to get, we want to have measurements that we can, we can have timelines with. And I think that's really important in a policy to, to really push those, those leagues. So we have the legs on, on what kind of, uh, what kind of milestones are we getting to? And so I would really want to push that, you know, and I have a bunch more in here about specifics, but also want to recognize that the university system should acknowledge a little more openly about indigenous knowledge. You know, it's in the system now, but making sure that, you know, that the knowledge that we have is sometimes immeasurable. It's, it's passed down and it's oral and how to gauge that and how to be supportive of that of your students to really get back to your the communities and ask those questions. It's really difficult and, 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 and nerve wracking as, as a researcher to making sure you're doing it the right way, but it also it's encouraged to go back to your community to expand research onto reservations and not be the subjects, be the researchers, that develop our own agendas with research centers. Those are the things we like as tribes to, to be a part of the, the conversation, to be developing those research agendas and not be the subjects of. So I think those are just some of the highlights that I like to deliver in my testimony, but I think you know, this conversation will, it will be ongoing, but also more detailed as we, as, as we move forward. And I'd like to thank uh, the Board of Regents, the President and Governor for the opportunity to give testimony today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you told me you had more to offer because that was all very valuable information, as was everything else that we received. Uh, this is a good first step and we will continue these uh, discussions. And as I said, we look to you for for guidance and wisdom, as you indicated, which is in existence, and we should pay attention to it. So, thank you. Well, I, I guess once again, I want to thank Dr. Jennings for her work, and uh, this will be an ongoing discussion. We will not stop uh, at, and feel good about ourselves and think we've done something nice because we just started. So, I promise that. At this time, I think we're going to have to get to a discussion regarding in supporting incoming freshmen with the summer bridge program. And I think uh, President Thompson has a few things to say about this. So please. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, thank you, title chairman for traveling down here and being with us today. We appreciate it very much. And thank you, President Menendez for setting up this program. Uh, thank you. As noted yesterday, we all recognize that this past year with the pandemic has posed significant challenges. And for a lot of our students, a lot of our faculty and our chancellors in border regions, we've had to deal with both the expected and the unexpected consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. UW system is committed to helping all students succeed. And that means meeting students vary in academic, social, financial, mental health, and other needs. And one of the programs that is helping us to do this is the UW Systems Summer Bridge Program, which is designed to assist incoming freshmen make a successful transition to college life. And you heard from the gentleman from the Menominee Tribe who told you about the People's Program as one of the examples who was very successful. But the Summer Bridge Program is for all students that uh, are coming to our colleges. And after the challenges of the past year, this program, I think, is more important than ever. And we made an effort this year to increase it, and in some cases, double. We expect the number of students participating in this year's Summer Bridge Program to be more than double the usual turnout. In fact, the latest estimates 
are that there's about 3,000 students who will take part. I know in Platteville, they've tripled the number from 500 to 1,500. To tell us more, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Warren Anderson, who is the Senior Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer for the UW system. Dr. Warren Anderson. Good morning. Uh, I was worried that 15 minutes wouldn't be enough to go through all the important parts of bridge programs. Uh, but given the conversation that we just had, I, I think that was the perfect segue into what uh, was addressed. Um, I had a, a series of prepared remarks, but given the time, I'll make sure that we have those so we can share those out. So I'll go through and just hit on a couple of high points from what I um, had planned. Um, as we think about expanding access, everything that you just heard is the reason why this is important. Uh, as a person who is a product of uh, a bridge program who's overseeing system-wide bridge programs, I can attest to, to the impact that these programs have on the attendees. Um, while you will know about the doubling of the participants in the bridge programs that we're talking about right now, I can tell you that there are other significant pipeline programs happening on our campuses that are not included in these numbers. So we are trying our hardest to make a, a significant dent in what it is we, we, we're trying to do. Um, as President Thompson has said a number of times, uh, this is something that's our responsibility to do as a system. When we start to think about the impact we have, not just on our campuses, but across the entire state, what you just heard is just a microcosm of the issue that we're trying to tackle. We were just talking about the impact on uh, our native reservations, but let's think about the impact on a lot of our urban centers and our rural centers. Those students face the same level of challenge when they get to our campuses as possible. The one thing that I want you to recognize before we go too far into detail with any of this is the reason that students, specifically students of color and from historically excluded populations don't finish our institutions rarely has it anything to do with the academics. They can do the work. It's the social, socio-emotional, and co-curricular initiatives that are gonna be key for these students to be successful. And we need to start putting a lot more emphasis in that. So as we think about it, where we are with the pandemic, we have a number of students across the country who are reconsidering their plans to go to college, reconsidering their reason for going to college. And really, when you think about all of the other issues happening in society related to COVID and not, questioning whether or not they actually belong on our campuses. And it's not just the preparation that's the challenge, it's those silos that we have on our campuses, as well as the lack of communication that we sometimes have between our institutions, the communities that we serve in, as well as the K-12 districts that uh, we're a part of. The first thing that I wanna do is make sure I recognize the chancellors. Um, they were given, uh, I think, an unbelievable task of doubling the number of participants in the summer bridge programs, and they did it a lot quicker than I even thought they could do it. Um, to double the amount of students in a bridge program is not an easy feat, because when they were given this task, many of them were months into planning already. So they were able to take this, expand what they did uh, to allow more students who actually need uh, access to these programs to be a part of it. So I really commend them. I commend overall, first and foremost, uh, Governor Thompson. The first thing that he talked about in my interview for this job was the need to get more students of color on our campuses. Um, given my response to him, I'm surprised I still got the job. Uh, but in our conversations back and forth, it's clear to me that he understands that this is an imperative for the success and sustainability of the system. So going along with a comment that was made by one of our, our guests, this is the opportune time for us to really tackle an issue uh, to the same level of degree that we've tackled COVID. And that really is addressing the issue of access to our universities, looking at it from the entire pipeline, from access all the way through graduation and addressing the challenges and barriers that exist on our campuses uh, for that to happen. As we think about summer bridge programs, and I promised uh, Jess I would be brief, uh, the thing to think about is specifically for students that come from underrepresented, underserved, underprepared populations, those that have excluded, historically been excluded from higher education, it's access to being on the campuses that, that are going to help make them successful. Summer bridge programs have been shown to really have significant impact on the persistence from second to third year, all the way through retention and successful graduation for students from these populations. 
yet we don't spend enough money. And this is not just here at the University of Wisconsin system. Nationally, we don't put the resources into bridge work when we know it works. This is where the University of Wisconsin system has an opportunity to be different than other systems of institution, systems of higher education in this country. And I think we're taking the appropriate first steps, but I'm listening to the conversation yesterday. And this is, you know, my former boss, Jim Schmidt was in here and I always told him, you know, if I get off the stage and I still have a job, I don't think I went too far. But listening to the conversations yesterday, listening to the conversation today, there's a disconnect between the level of importance we place on this work and the resources that we dedicate to this work, not just at the campus level, at the system level. We've had a number of conversations and this president has worked tirelessly to find funding to support this work more than has ever been dedicated to this before. So I commend him for that. But I also say we've got a lot more work to do. Our student population is not getting less diverse. And in fact, the only populations that are growing of student graduates across the country are students of color. So if we're not going to do the work to actually prepare them, then we are really skirking our responsibility. Um, as we think about where we have the biggest opportunities, it really is in pipeline and bridge work, bridge work in particular, because it's those two to six weeks prior to matriculation that can determine how successful a student is going to be those first four years in school. And I say first four years because we shouldn't be just thinking about undergraduate. We know at this point, an undergraduate degree really is the entry level. How do we start preparing them for life post that? I've already talked about the case for bridge and I think our guests before us have really went into that. I don't think there's any more um, argument that we need to make for that other than finding the actual resources and putting the priority on this work that we have not done before. Um, we've had, I don't know how many hours of conversations are around this work over the six months that I've been here, but it's time to move from conversation to action. And the work that the chancellors did to move from the 1,100 and so students that were in uh, projected in the pipeline or the bridge programs that we talked about to 2,600, that is a huge start, but it is 2,600 out of the 160,000 students we have in our system. We really need to start taking extra steps, both in the curricular and co-curricular, non-curricular uh, spaces to actually have an impact on this work. Clicker's not, oh, there we go. Um, These are the critical imperatives, and I wanna really, uh, I'll end on this and, and not go too much more into this. The continuous funding is important. President Thompson mentioned yesterday the $1.3 million we put aside uh, for bridge loans. That shouldn't be a loan moving forward. That is something that the campuses, I think at this point, recognize uh, the system should be supporting these kinds of programs because it's a system-wide imperative. I know President Thompson has looked at identifying ways that we can make this funding ongoing, but that has to be a critical part of the conversation moving forward. When we think about access, it also has to be the conversation about retention, persistence, and graduation. It doesn't make any sense to get them here. We get a million students today, and next year we're down 750,000 students. It really has to be a conversation of how we get them from the door all the way across the stage. And given that this is the only population, the students that are identified for bridge programs, this is the only population that's growing. So it makes sense that we need to nurture this population to make sure that we are sustainable um, in the years to come. My office, as we start to build it up, we're gonna be dedicating all of our attention primarily to access, but also how we can work with our campuses to make sure that they have the resources and services and supports they need from system to actually make this uh, truly livable on the campuses. So I can stop there because I can promise you, uh, you will hear a lot more from me in, in, in coming board meetings, so I don't wanna bore you too much, um, but I will turn it back over and ask if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, Regent President Menides. Well, thank you for your hard work, Dr. Anderson. I know I, the chancellor at Eau Claire was very sad to lose you, uh, but you're now at the system and your impact will be felt system-wide. And I hope that we're able to get the funding you request because this may answer some of the questions that Regent Antwell has regarding what are we gonna do with declining population of certain numbers or kinds of students 
there are other students out there that uh, need some encouragement and some help uh, to be to become successful students. And, and this is one way that we can have this done. So thank you for the hard work, Dr. Anderson. Um, since there were no questions, I assume that there weren't any any need for a discussion. So we'll go to the next thing on the agenda, which is a resolution of appreciation for uh, Regent Becky Lovesell. This is her service on the UW System Board of Regents. At this time, uh, I would ask Regent Chris Peterson to present the board's resolution of appreciation. Well, I am very pleased to be here today to um, tell you a little bit more about our wonderful Regent Becky Lovzo and um, do this appreciation for her. Becky and I first met when we were both lobbying with the Wisconsin Dairy Business Association in Washington, D.C. in the early 2000s. They always sent us to visit the Capitol when the swampy summer air was so thick that you could spoon it into a cup. The only place more miserable is a hay mow during second crop harvest. I think we both have been there. Becky has done it all. She was elected to the National Dairy Board, the National United Dairy Industry Board, and has traveled to China. I'm going to get these things out of my way. Traveled to China as a part of the Wisconsin Rural Leadership Program. She has worked with the professional dairy producers of Wisconsin on their foundation board and with their mentorship program. In 2013 and 14, she supervised the UW Madison Dairy Science 535 capstone project with four female students. She is elected twice to the board of Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, which used to be called the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board, where she has served on a variety of committees. Becky has served on the Wisconsin Technical College System Board since 2013 and is currently its president. She also has served on the party, Partyville. I never get that right. I wish I lived in Partyville. <laughs> Partyville School Board since 2005 and is currently vice chairman. I'd love to see the meetings lined up on her calendar. Becky helps manage her family's 155 cow dairy herd. The family is all here today for this honor. She keeps the books, does the work scheduling, personnel management, and public relations, welcomes countless tours to their farm, milks an occasional shift, and does field work when it's needed. You think this, this would be enough, but it's not. Becky is a registered diagnostic medical sonographer employed part-time for 40 years at Unity Point Health Meritor Hospital in Madison. She's a respected team member working under the direction of 25 radiologists. She is also a clinical instructor for the ultrasound technician program. Becky has been published in two textbooks and one professional journal on the topic of renal transplantation. What an incredible servant. It's pretty amazing that we've had two female dairy farmers on the Board of Regents for the past two years. <laughs> Becky's commitment, dedication, and enthusiasm for the UW system is so evident to us all. It has been a joy to get to know you better, Becky, travel with you to the Rose Bowl together with our your husband, Ralph, and my husband, Gary. We had a lot of fun. And I'm just the biggest joy is to have this chance today to honor you. I am pleased to present the resolution of appreciation to Regent Becky Levzo. Whereas Becky Levzo has dedicated two years of exemplary service as a regent of the University of Wisconsin system from July 2019 through July 2021 as the president of the Wisconsin Technical College System Board. And whereas Becky has worked to enhance the partnership of these two nationally recognized public higher public higher education systems, both of which are critical to developing a highly skilled 21st century workforce for the state. And whereas Becky served as a thoughtful member of multiple committees, including the Business and Finance Committee, Research, Economic Development and Innovation Committee, and the Personnel Matters Review Committee, and whereas 
Becky helped honor and reward educators across the UW system for their work, supporting student success through her service on the Diversity Awards Committee, and whereas Becky helped to select future camper, campus leadership for the Phoenix and Falcons as a member of the Chancellor Search Committees for UW Green Bay and UW River Falls, and whereas Becky and fa a family dairy farmer who shares a passion for both education and agriculture was a staunch supporter of UW Madison's Babcock Hall renovation, observing that the Babcock project would play an important role in addressing the dairy industry's crisis. And whereas in 2020, Becky, who is also a healthcare worker, visited the UW Oshkosh Nursing Program's simulation lab, calling the nursing program just amazing and observing that she believes students who are being trained for success in the workplace and will be strong contributors to their communities. Be it therefore resolved that the Board of Regents of the University of Wisconsin system hereby commends Becky Lebzo for her service to the UW system and outstanding commitment to education in Wisconsin. Thank you, Chris, for those kind words. And uh, as she said, we've been friends for a, a long time, especially through the dairy industry. And I'm happy we were able to connect again in this capacity. First of all, I'd like to introduce my family members who are here today. They're in the back of the room here. Many of you have heard stories about my family and my operation. My two children are here, Amanda and her husband, Ryan Seichter. They're both UW-Madison and Platteville graduates, um, agriculture teachers, and also tech ed teachers in Partyville and in Waupon. Very proud of that. My son, Kenneth, graduated college and is working his way into the farming operation. Along with him is his friend, Jackie Volz, who is an ICU nurse at Freighted Hospital and also a clinical nursing instructor in the Milwaukee area. Very proud of that. My children are fourth generation on the Leveso home farm. And since we purchased part of my parents' farm near Arlington on the Prairie, they are the sixth generation. I'm very proud of that. And one thing I'd like to note is the family has, uh, the family farm in Arlington has been passed down mostly through the female members of the family. All right. <laughs> uh, my husband, Ralph, is also here today. Um, I would not be here today without him rep, uh, representing the agricultural uh, community on the Technical College Board if it wasn't for Ralph. Without him, um, he's a constant supporter of all my different board services and never wavers when the call comes to serve. I can't say thank you enough to my family and be more proud of my family for being at home and being here for me today. Thank you. I would like to thank all my fellow regents. I am blessed to have gotten to know some amazing, dedicated, caring individuals on this board. We are a family, a community who I am honored to be a part of. My mother, Helen Reiner, was so looking forward to being here today to see this. As you know, that wasn't in the cards, but the outpouring of support and care shown to me and my family in her passing was a real comfort and really show that a board community can become family. Thank you all very much for that. Thank you to Jess and Megan and all the staff for your assistance through my time here, to all the UW system staff. Thank you for your patience, quick response to questions, and genuine friendship shown. 
Thank you, Regent Drew Peterson, for the opportunity to serve on not one, but two search committees. These experiences have exposed me to even more in-depth workings of the UW system. Thank you, Drew. I was fortunate to be a, li a liaison to UW Oshkosh and UW Milwaukee. Thank you, Chancellors Lovett and Moni, for the meetings, the materials, the books, the extra time spent showcasing your campuses to me. Kudos to all your staff who have really made these experiences gratifying. My questions were never left unanswered. And let me tell you, I had a lot of questions. Thank you. Governor Thompson, what a champion for the system. Your constant level of energy and enthusiasm to get something done. All I can say is, wow, it's amazing. What an asset you are to the whole system. Thank you for all your efforts. And you know, being a part of the dairy agriculture industry, I applaud the hard work it took to increase the addition of 20 UW Extension County agents, the push for funding on the completion of the UW Center for Dairy Research and the Animal Muscle Lab, the Dairy Hub Collaborative Initiative, and the addition to the UW Madison Veterinary School. This demonstrates the forward thinking progress to a stronger agriculture sector in the state of Wisconsin that we will all benefit from. You know, in my wildest dreams, I never thought I would have the opportunity to be a regent. To be honest, when I was in school, I didn't even know what a regent was. <laughs> I grew up on my family dairy farm near Arlington. It's about 25 miles north of Madison. I'm the oldest of four children. You know, you're supposed to be the, the oldest one is supposed to be the responsible one, the one to take charge. We were not rewarded for getting good grades, but expected to do well in school. I did well in school. I was in the top 10% of my class. I really, really wanted to go to college, but my parents didn't have the money and they often said, you'll just get married and you won't really use it. So when my guidance counselor said there was a bus going to Portage Hospital to learn about careers, and many of my friends were getting on that bus to go, I thought I might as well go along. I didn't have anything else to do. When we arrived at the hospital, everyone on the bus went with either the nurses or the lab personnel. The manager of the radiology department stood on the street alone. You know, I really felt sorry for him that nobody wanted to go with him. And since I didn't have any career plans, I figured I might as well follow Mr. Vinny. Um, little did I know it would lead to my future career path in a 40 plus year career in medical imaging. I worked different jobs to put myself through school. And after working a few years, I did return back to school as a working adult to pursue ultrasound and later complete my bachelor's degree. My passion, my mission is education. I seek to find opportunities for all. Every campus, whether UW or Wisconsin Technical College, invigorates me to want to do more. I am amazed at all the programs, the internships, the networking, and now the online opportunities available to make an education possible for everyone. As was noted earlier, I'm vice president of the school board of Partyville School District, and my time on the board includes chairman of the curriculum committee, and I also chair the building and grounds committee. Serving on my local, local school board for 16 years has provided me with the unique perspective of seeing the many challenges with budgets to providing the necessary educational needs of our rural school district. Partyville School District is not big. Our K-12 enrollment is only 850 students. But currently, by my urging, we provide 12 dual credit courses, five advanced placement opportunities through the Technical College and the UW systems for our students. I am very proud of this. By offering these credits, our students have a jump start on their future educational journey. 
Many of these students would probably not have advent advanced their educational career if it was not for this opportunity. The classes demonstrate they can handle a college class, they can succeed at a college level, and most importantly, have an in-house scholarships that provides them this opportunity. Many of these individuals are now employed in the jobs that provide a meaningful and well compensated career. We need to keep pushing for more high school entry level courses like dual credit and advanced placement for our students. Dual credit and advanced placement classes build confidence in knowing that college is possible. It opens eyes to programs and dreams attainable. It provides a ladder to a successful career. We need to expose more middle and high school students to these opportunities. But let's not forget also the adult learner like myself, who I mentioned earlier, who returned to school. Wisconsin Technical College System, the average age of student of a student now is 28 to 30. By partnering with businesses, pathways to continuing an education can be made. I'm excited to hear the progress that Moonshot for Equity is making with inroads for education by collaboration of the UW-Milwaukee, UW-Parkside, Milwaukee Area Technical College, and Carthage College, will, along with local businesses for educational pathways for overcoming barriers frequently encountered by our students. The UW and Technical College need to continue investigating ways to make it easier, more economical, and more accessible for students to accomplish their educational goals. These are examples of what really excites me. People often ask why I get involved. Being on a local school board, the Wisconsin Technical College System Board and the Regents have provided me a unique perspective, an opportunity to serve students from 4K to whatever degree or certification attained. I'm not really sure if anyone else has served in this trifecta capacity at one time, but I did it. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. Education is the key to the success of the Wisconsin economy and our democratic society. We need to keep pushing forward with even more pathways to success for all our citizens. Governor Thompson and fellow regents, you need the Wisconsin Technical College system now more than ever to continue filling that pipeline of learners. Wisconsin's economy needs this. Our citizens deserve these possibilities. I am really grateful for the chance to have served as a regent. I will be leaving the board today, but know that I plan to continue supporting the future educational needs of all. Thank you all. Thank you, Regent Lizzo. Well, last year, as we know, because of the pandemic, resulted in many disruptions to the way we do business. And one of the things we missed was the opportunity to formally say goodbye to Regent John Bailey, whose service ended in 2019. I'd ask Regent Drew Peterson to present the board's resolution of appreciation to Regent Bailey. Thank you, President Manny Deeds. Let me first say, I don't know how you did the trifecta. I mean, I've done a duo, being president of one board, serving on this board, then being vice chair of your school district. You must look forward to Fridays. <laughs> and to your husband, you must look forward to Saturdays. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome back our former leader, colleague, and friend, Regent President Emeritus John Robert Bailing to our meeting today and his lovely wife. 
John served with distinction on this board from 2012 to 2019, and he was unanimously elected by his peers to serve as vice president for two years before becoming president from 2017 to 2019. I had the honor of working alongside John first as a regent and then as a vice president, and we struck up a strong camaraderie and a deep friendship that lasts today. John and I came from similar backgrounds. We both worked for President Thompson when he was governor. John in Madison and me in D.C., although John did do a stint in D.C., but that was before I moved over from Capitol Hill. We had talked several times on the phone back in those days regarding transportation policy and agricultural matters. We didn't have email back then, believe it or not, uh, but we had never met in person until several years later when we were introduced by a mutual friend back here in Madison. It goes without saying, but John maintains a strong reputation as a lawyer, a business thinker, and a committed Chippewa Valley citizen and opinion leader for the region. As a former president of this board and the current president of his law firm, Weld Riley, John has cemented himself in his region where he is a known commodity. But he also has the ability to enjoy the natural re uh, resources of the region, which he so enjoys. John is just as comfortable behind the desk as he is in a deer stand or a duck blind. He has a passion for the outdoors and he perseveres and advances that passion while representing a myriad of statewide clients who are responsibly growing the economy of the state and our region. In fact, Regent Bailing was the first president in the history of the Board of Regents to come from the Chippewa Valley region. He also set the stage for our current region president to grow that number. His Ed Manny Deeds, as we know, is an Eau Claire resident and is now the second region president from the Chippewa Valley. As vice president and president of the board, John focused his leadership energies on representing all of our UW campuses and ensuring our outstate campuses got equivalent attention to Madison and Milwaukee. As a UW River Falls undergrad and a UW Madison Law School grad, John never lost sight of his roots as a kid from Polk County who would go on to do great things. That's an important role our regions play, representing congressional districts to ensure geographic balance. And it's a vital role to protect and advance regional initiatives focused on improving our state's economic prosperity and well being. For instance, during John's service, the city of Eau Claire and the campus really saw a renaissance take place all across the city. Whether it was downtown hotel re revitalizations, new business sightings, or improvements on the campus, UWEC blossomed under Chancellor Jim Schitt's, Schmidt, Schmidt's leadership, coupled with John and Ed's involvement as local region members. Perhaps one of their finest accomplishments was the formation, construction, and opening of the Pablo Art Center at the Confluence, one of the more unique and innovative private-public partnerships for which the UW system has ever been involved. The Pablo Arts Center sits on the banks of the Chippewa River in the heart of downtown. The $51 million building is a state-of-the-art venue for visiting acts and performers, but also a practice, rehearsal, and performance space for talented music and theater arts majors at UW Eau Claire. During John's presidency, UW-Eau Claire served as a host for one of our monthly meetings, and he, along with Chancellor Jim and Regent Manadeeds, were recognized for their civic leadership, creativity, and dogged determination to get the Pablo Center at the Confluence built. As they cut the ribbon on the building's opening, it was a proud day for the UW system, but also a demonstration of impressive local regent leadership of giving back to the communities for which we all represent. Currently, the Pablo Center is the premier focal point of downtown, and the facility is located only a few steps from the student apartments at Haymarket Landing, another gem in Eau Claire's redevelopment crown. Of course, Regent Bailing served on and led a number of committees and task forces and chancellor searches and other high-profile items during his years of service, and I'll highlight that during the presentations of his resolution. But more important than those contributions were the time and dedication John put forth during his tenure. Speaking from recent experience, it's not being easy. It's not easy being a region president. It's not easy when you have a full-time 
growing professional career. It's not easy when you're traveling across the country to represent clients. And it's not easy on your family as your schedule, with all due respect, becomes something you lose control of to Jess. But in, Jeff, in John's case, and now Ed's, there's an added burden of distance being so far from Madison. On my account, John attended and then held weekly leadership conference calls every Wednesday, representing over 190 hours of engagement with the UW senior staff on board matters as vice president and then as president. But John went a step further and drove to Madison virtually every Wednesday during his presidency to cover the policy waterfront with President Cross, senior staff leadership, and me. So he was fully informed of day-to-day -day activities of our system and our board, always working to ensure that there were no surprises, which turned into few surprises, which in, then turned into what's next. Through all of his service, John remained resolute, focused, agenda-driven, and member-led, meaning, meaning he took direction from colleagues, even Regent Whitburn from time to time, to generate strong results. When John and I maintain very different leadership styles, but I learned a great deal from him, as did others, about how to craft a priority agenda, lay out timelines for action, build momentum and support for your initiative, and get it passed oftentimes overwhelmingly. Finishing up here. For all of the time and dedication, Regent Emeritus John Bailing has put forward, the board salutes you for your service, collegiality, no nonsense board leadership, and most importantly, your friendship. Congratulations, Regent President Emeritus John Bailing on a job incredibly well done. I've still got a couple whereas's to deliver here. Whereas John Robert Bailing has served to the citizens of Wisconsin with distinguished leadership during his seven years on the University of Wisconsin System Board of Regents, including two years as board president and two years as vice president. Whereas John is the first board president from the Chippewa Valley and the youngest board president in three decades, as well as a proud graduate of UW River Falls and the UW Law School. And whereas John chaired the Tenure Policy Task Force, charged with reviewing tenure policy and making recommendations to the Board of Regents, which adopted new and revised tenure policies based on the task force's recommendations in March 2016, balancing accountability with flexibility. And whereas the revised tenure policies were constructed with the following three goals in mind, as articulated by Regent Bailing to reaffirm the board's and the system's commitment to strong tenure and academic freedom, to increase our accountability to students and taxpayers of the state, and to ensure our state has comparable tenure policy that allows us to continue to be in the global education marketplace. And whereas John served on numerous standing committees, including business and finance, capital planning and budget, research, economic development and innovation, student discipline, and other student appeals, and the Personnel Review Committee. And whereas John served on three chancellor searches for committees at UW Eau Claire, UW Stout, and the former UW Colleges and Extension Chancellorship. Whereas John's previous board service includes the Foundation Board of Wisconsin 4-H, an influential outreach service and extension that reaches well over 32,000 youth throughout the state. And whereas the UW system and Board of Regents built a stronger, more effective partnership with the legislature and the governor during John's time leading the board, and John worked diligently to advocate for our campuses, govern wisely, and remain accountable to the taxpayers, citizens, and students we serve. Be it therefore resolved that on behalf of the citizens of this state and a grateful university community, the University of Wisconsin System Board of Regents highly commends John Robert Bailing for his leadership and achievements as president, as vice president, and as a member of the UW System Board of Regents. Congratulations, John. Sure. Governor, jump in. Mm -hmm. 
Good morning, President Many Deeds, President Thompson, and Board of Regents. And thank you for allowing me to join your meeting this morning. When I served as president of the board, I started every speech the same way. The Wisconsin system consists of over 165,000 students, 44 employees, and 26 campuses. So one of the largest educational systems in the world, and it's truly one of Wisconsin's economic driving engines. I'll miss saying those words. But regions think about that. 44,000 employees. When I was president of the board, that statement carried a lot of weight on my shoulders. You are in essence, the second largest employer in the state of Wisconsin, second only to the Menards Corporation. But with that great weight comes great opportunities. And I just wanna take a little bit of time and talk about some of those opportunities. And of course, to thank the people who worked with me and helped me get onto the Board of Regents. First of all, let's go back. Let's go back a couple of decades to 1990, where I was a young country kid coming off a farm in Little Cumberland, Wisconsin. At that time, I'd accepted an internship at the Wisconsin Office of Federal State Relations in Washington, D.C. On my second week on the job, I met the boss, Governor Tommy Thompson. And he looked me in the eye and he shook my hand. He said, young man, what do you want to do when you grow up? I thought I threw him a curveball. I didn't. I said, Governor, I've got a couple of bouts under my belt as an amateur boxer. Someday I want to go pro. And without missing a beat, he pivots. And he goes like this. He puts up his dukes and he goes, young man, these hands retired more people than Social Security. <laughs> what? Now I'm the one speechless, but that's really the beginning of the relationship. And thereafter I was hooked and I spent the next decade working, uh, working for that man. In my time as a practicing lawyer, I often used the skills and the abilities and even sometimes even the quotes that I learned in those 10 years working in the governor's office. The governor during that time, it won't surprise you, was an endless ball of energy. He was a political icon, he was a friend, and to many of us in the governor's office, he was a, excuse me, <clears throat> he was a second father. Got something in my eye there. <laughs> when the board made the decision to hire Governor Tommy Thompson, I was thrilled with that decision. I couldn't think of anyone more prepared to work with the left, to work with the right, and people of all ages and demographics. Board, very well done, and thank you. Since we're talking about opportunities, I've got a couple more I need to talk about. During my tenure in the Thompson administration, I had the greatest opportunity of all happen. As some of you know, at the time I worked in the governor's office, and my bride Tabitha, who's here with us today, worked at the Department of Commerce. The very day after we'd met, Tabitha calls into sick into the secretary's office, Secretary Bill McCashin. I called the governor's chief of staff, and we spent the whole day together. And we really haven't spent any day since, since that time period. Governor, I don't know if I ever told you that story, but I probably owe you some overtime. <laughs> Certainly, I want to thank my lovely wife for having the, the time and the patience, patience and the commitment to allow me to travel both for work and for this job. It's a big job, as Drew knows, and as our good friend Ed Mendy Deeds is learning about every day. But my wife, in addition to being supportive, was in, always incredibly honest. One night I was reminiscing, and I said to her, how many great leaders do you think come from Wisconsin? And without even putting down her book, she eloquently stated, one less than you think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
I also wanted to say thank you to former Regent President Drew Peterson. When I was the president, Drew served for both years as my vice chair. At the time, we took on issues like chancellor hiring, free speech, three times, and tenure reform. Although in the era of a global pandemic, sometimes those issues seem lesser, at the time, they were challenging and they're very controversial. Drew Peterson always had my back 24 seven. It's hard to find somebody in today's world that will do that. And for that, I am eternally grateful and thank you. Of course, we also need to recognize Jeff Lathrop. When I was elected board president, the board secretary decided to retire the very next day. We needed to recruit a replacement. Drew and I said, what are we going to do? Jess was working in the board office at that time, but in a lesser role, and she opted not to apply. I think it may have been my, my form of management, but she's never told me why. But needless to say, we coaxed her into, even after a failed statewide search, to give it a shot, and she said, John, I'll only do it in an interim role. And here we are, years later, still together. Just Lathrop, if the younger regents haven't learned, she's an incredible person from a policy perspective. She has just perfect education and background. And if it wasn't for her, being on the Board of Regents and certainly serving as president of the board would be virtually impossible. Jess, your, your patience and your wisdom, but most importantly, your friendship, I cannot thank you enough for. Thank you. People a lot of times talk about Tom Brady, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. That's how we refer to Jess in the system office, the greatest of all time in the university system, and we meant it. I'd also like to say thank you to Quinn Williams. Prior to joining the board, Quinn served for almost a decade as the DNR's top agency lawyer. He worked for both a governor who's a Republican and a Democrat. I always marvel at the lawyers who can stay on as general counsel in multiple administrations. It says a lot about character. In a moment of weakness, we recruited Quinn over to the UW, and hopefully he's never looked back. I always consider Quinn to be a lawyer's lawyer, someone who I look to for strategic, strategic advice and legal methodology, oftentimes six days a week, and usually at 7.30 in the morning, we would talk about important board matters and what we needed to get that done that day. There's a Quentin Tarantino movie. I don't know if you saw it, but Jess just got very nervous when I mentioned quoting a line from a Quentin Tarantino movie. There's a Quentin Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, two very great actors, Brad, uh, Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio. One's a stuntman for DiCaprio, who serves as a, uh, he is a, a actor who's a, about to hang it up. And there's one of the scenes where the Brad Pitt character is reminiscing. After spending a decade together, he's a little more than a brother, a little less than a wife, a little more than a brother. That exactly sums up our relationship with Quinn. Quinn Williams, thank you for your commitment to the system and to the UW and for joining us. Lastly, where is he? Newly coined Vice President Brandt. Prior to joining the system, Jeff and I had worked together on a number of policy issues in the Capitol. Although we often didn't agree, we could always find a way to work out an amicable, amicable and positive resolution. He's a tremendous thinker. We recruited him to come out of the Capitol and join the system as a legislative representative. He didn't also know that at the same time, I'd require him to write every, every speech I gave during my tenure as president. That was something that we just forced on him. We never told him about. But to his credit, he could always find a way to make and say what I was thinking, but in a far more elegant fashion than a young farm kid from Cumberland. Thank you, Jeff. In closing, Regents, thank you for allowing me to share some time with you today. The role of a Regent is not always easy and your work is certainly never done. Regents, I thank you for investing in Wisconsin, 
your time and your efforts. Regents, I thank you for investing in our students and most importantly, on Wisconsin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Regent Peterson and Regent Bailey. Yes. Sure. You can say them right now. Uh, thank you, uh, President Benedict, for giving just uh, a couple of minutes to say thank you. Uh, first off, uh, your first minute, you've done a wonderful job. Thank you, Ed. Thanks. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, Becky, uh, you're an outstanding regent. And a, and a fantastic educator. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of the state of Wisconsin for all that you do. People like you, you know, are so important to be on a school board, a you know, vocational board, a university, and still do your farm work. And I know talking to you last night about how great it is to get on our tractor and mow hay and this. And as you said, uh, Ray K, and bring it all together. And that's what you've always done, bring it all together. And I just wanna say on behalf of myself personally, thank you. And to you, John Bailey, what do I say? Thank you. As a very valuable employee. And I can remember your wedding I went to and your lovely wife, Tabitha. And I said to Tabitha that night, I said, Tabitha, I don't have to supervise him anymore. <laughs> That's your job. And you got your hands full. And boy, did she ever. And John, your successes have been outstanding, whether it be on the farm, hunting, in the law practice, in the courtroom, working for me as governor, being a very valuable member of the Board of Regents. And I just would like to say on behalf of myself personally, and I would like to also say for the state of Wisconsin, we're very well served when a John Bailey and a Becky Lefsov throws up their arms and says, I will serve. So on behalf of me personally, I just would like to say thank you, John. Thank you, Becky, for a job well done. I think that goes for all of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, President Thompson. Well, now we have the recent uh, region communication petitions and memorials. Before we adjourn, do any regions have any communications, petitions, or memorials to share? Hearing none, we stand adjourned. Thank you.